my goal and my main skill set, it is to give and help people and make them feel the best version of themselves, but not just members, coaches and everybody. I'll literally have a coffee meeting with each one of my coaches to talk about personal life because every coach, every person is driven by something and not everybody's just financial. So you got to go the extra mile as a gym owner and spend time with your coaches more than you probably do already. So you get to know their personal life and you get to know what's stopping them to become happier. Hello and welcome. Today I'm here with Luan. And Luan in fitness space is pretty much everything you can ask for. Coach, business, business owner, and uh, business and coach consultant. And basically from A to Z, everything with, uh, <laughs> what you can experience there, right? Being around. First of all, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. And yes, like, uh, like you mentioned, uh, been in different roles and um, uh, fortunate enough to be around fitness in all type of aspects for sure. Okay, cool. So let's, uh, it's pretty much of a traditional question here. Mm -hmm. Your fitness as a child, as a kid, what were your sports, how you got into fitness? What, uh, what was your journey from, from when you were a child? So, uh, originally I was born in Miami and I moved to Brazil when I was three. Uh, so you can only imagine Brazil and some people will like to call it soccer. Some people like to call it football. We say football, uh, in America it is soccer. So I grew up playing soccer, a little bit of background on my family, my whole family, including my, uh, grand grandfathers, brothers, uh, my father, all of them play basketball. Like okay. my, actually my grandfather's brother play in the national team like Olympics and everything for Brazil, for Brazil. Okay. Yeah. So they're, they're, my, my whole family is into sports, right? I never, you know, cause of my height wasn't too much of an advantage to play basketball. I know how to shoot and stuff, but uh, soccer was my thing. Play soccer my entire life since I was probably three to four until I was 18. When I was already 13, 12, I started playing a little bit more professionally, meaning like doing different tournaments, traveling with the team around the country and stuff like that. And uh, when I was about 16, 17, I started to have opportunities to maybe sign for professional teams or go for a U20 or stuff like that, or really invest to be my lifestyle, right? Mm -hmm. And I always had on the back of my mind uh, to become, uh, not to become, but to come to America since I was American, but I haven't been in those 15 years of my life. Okay. I was never back so, to America. So is it your father's family is from Brazil? Everybody's from Brazil. Or, all of or mom as well? Mom too. But you are American? Yes, okay. because they were okay. both living in America when Always. I was born. Yeah. So when I was 17, I was like, I had two opportunities. Number one, num letter A will be either stay in Brazil and fight for that professional spot and probably not make so much money to start and then really fight because just like basketball in America, everybody plays football, everybody plays soccer. So it's a very competitive area. Or why not go to America and play? And by the way, when I was playing soccer, I had to basically put school aside because mm -hmm. that's, that's, what, that's what we only did, right? So I, I really went to high school in a school that you could, didn't even have to show up in school and you pass, right? Because my main focus was soccer, I mean, football. So uh, I was like, okay, how about I go to America, try it out there. Maybe I'll become professional there. Or if not, I'll play for a university and have a plan B, which is studying. Is it good paid? In America? Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah, because I, I don't really follow much of the US sports, but I would imagine that American football and uh, basketball, base baseball, baseball, basketball NASCAR, are way bigger, it. right? All of it. And I, it's, a, it's a very interesting topic that we can uh, talk about it one day, but I don't think so soccer, it is growing a lot which is the football in America, but I don't think it's ever going to get to those levels just because I, I don't think the media allows it to because mm -hmm. like space on a TV, because football is the biggest sports in the world. So once football, when, once, in my opinion, once American people start liking football, they kind of not going to care so much about the other ones because a football, you only need a ball or maybe anything, right? To play everything else, you kind of need more of a setup to, to play around. So, but anyways, uh, 
anything in America, it's good pay. So if you're a good player and you play for big teams, yes. Okay. You, you get good money. So that would be still better than staying in Brazil? Yes. And, on, on, and because also the competition in Brazil was way bigger. So right? much. Okay. And not only that, by, not, by never being to America, you always had that in the back of your mind. Like, okay, I got to come back or the American dream or is it like movies, you know? So I had that in my mind. Was it like movies? Yes. So <laughs> I can tell you that college life, it is exactly like movies. Uh, and I live all that. So I ended up moving to America. Uh, just to answer your question, they pay good. Uh, but uh, like if you're for national team or if you play for like LA Galaxy or big teams, you make good money. But besides that, there's not too many op uh, options. Mm -hmm. So anyways, but I went straight to college, played college, got my, uh, got to study, got to live that lifestyle of which is playing a, a uh, university sport, you know. Did you have to show up to school more than when you were on a high school in Brazil? A lot more. <laughs> okay. and, the, and, and not only that, I had to keep a good GPA, which is a, a, a score and a, and a test, because you can only play for the team if your GPA is around 3.0, depending on the team. So you cannot, and you have to take full-time classes, which is 12 classes, or so, 12 credits. So they make sure that you not just doesn't matter how good you are. Time. Doesn't matter how good you are. They will not let you play unless your good grades are good and you're taking the classes. So it's a full time job, which was great. You know, can't complain. So I, I ended up living that life, and and that time, it's when I discovered CrossFit. One of the one of these days in the college, one of my friends, you know, uh, that's around 2011, 2012, and he was like, "Dude, you should you should try this this thing that people are doing. They swim, they climb walls, they do all this weird shit." And I was like, "Okay, why not?" Right? So I ended up trying, but that's how I met CrossFit. Is when I was uh, in college playing soccer, you know, and yeah. So my background is soccer. Played my whole life. I ended up coaching soccer too, which you can get into, you know, after. Okay. But yeah, soccer, football, however you call it. That's I, my I background. Have one, one more question towards this. Mm -hmm. I was not in my upbringing. I was not in a situation where there was some sport that I would be doing like you from four year old till basically a professional career. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I was always curious how people who have this kind of experience that you really through the pretty much basically all your young life mm -hmm. yeah, up to being an adult and still keep going for a professional, like you were doing this one thing. Was it, was it annoying at some point? Was it, did you want to quit or it was just like, it was so ingrained in that culture, especially in, especially mm -hmm. in Brazil that, that it was just like so natural thing to do. Mm -hmm. Like how, how, what was your perception? Was there up and downs? Because for, for a child to commit, if they are not forced to it, Yeah. Correct. <laughs> I know. <laughs> to commit for from four to 18, like you need to be pretty much obsessed not to, yes. not to have any uh, pushback. Right. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I think myself and everybody that goes through a career in sports from a young age up to either becoming a professional or just being a in a training lifestyle and competing lifestyle for over 10 years, there is a lot of up and downs right? Especially being a kid. But as a kid, all I wanted to do was play soccer for fun. Mm -hmm. I got in a very difficult and delicate situation when that became a uh, obligation. Like meaning like I will not be able to play on my school's team and be the cool kid from the school and be the best kid in the school playing and winning the, all the school's tournament because I had serious training with the team. So when that started to happen, he was like, hold on, hold on a second. Why, why can't I play? It's just soccer. But then the coach wouldn't allow because I would be wasting my energy or be having a chance to get injured. And a 12, 13 year old, like, you know, I want to be cool. I want to be in a- There is no so, such a thing as a limit in energy, right? <laughs> exactly. It's not even because of the energy. Like yeah. I'll literally be sitting uh, and watching all my best friends have fun and enjoy and raising the trophy. And I wouldn't be able to do it because I was, I had serious training. So on that little transition, Uh, it was a little difficult, but with my dad being an athlete as well, I always had, uh, he was very strict in a way that, okay, you're not going to eat this. You're going to sleep early. You're not going to play with your friends because you have a serious game. He was always like my personal coach 
to not let me mess up because sometimes you would understand as a kid, right? Yeah. And the coach is not around you all the time. So a kid can easily go and run and break his foot and that's it, right? Uh, but he was always that. And also making sure that I would have, you know, I was having fun, right? All my trainings and everything. Because when it becomes an obligation as a kid, if you have to work, it's basically like, I feel like if you have good parenting and good coaching, they kind of take all the pressure around for them and kind of let the kid just have fun literally have fun it's easier to maintain and i had from 13 to 16 i, I remember when i was 15 i went to my dad's bedroom i was like this is it i don't want to play anymore i'm tired like it's just too much too much of uh, uh obligations or too much of of pressure for me to to do that and he was like okay no problem you quit I'll, i'll call your coach and you're good and i was like all right right so he kind of You know, even though he was like, he's not easier than you thought. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> and then I was like, no, 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 I don't want to quit. You know, like, so, uh, but yeah, the pressure it's, it's, it's there. It's different. I feel like every athlete it's, we realize that it's discipline, you know, it's very easy to train when you're happy. Oh, like yeah. training when, you know, you're into fitness, like training when you're, when, when you everything have goes bills, well, when you have bills or when it's raining or when you got to take a bus to go less the real, but when you realize that that discipline is going to give you rewards, it's, 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 uh, it's what keep us there. You know, Yeah, I, I completely understand that the only thing that I, uh, I always wonder is how these kids get to understand it. Right. Because as a kid, you don't really see like, Or you don't probably give a shit when you were 12 about like, this will give me a college opportunity in US. And now for next six years, you need to grind every yes. single day just to get like, that's not in your head, right? Mm. At that moment, you It's don't really care about that. Correct. And I think good coaching and good parenting is where they, you know, it, it, and I, I have a lot of good friends of mine. They were like great players, meaning like great players, but they did not have that support. Mm -hmm. So they didn't become a player. There's so many stories about that in all sports, right? Uh, but basically, uh, it's funny because I was watching, an, uh, a, a, not a documentary or something about that. People were saying, oh, Cristiano Ronaldo, you're so good. And he was like, you should see the kid that I grew up with. And when you check the kid, he's not even a player nowadays. And you wonder why, right? So like, he's like, if you think I'm good, I had players better than me. But because of the discipline and because I was there, and I think for Cristiano, I don't know how the situation is, but usually a team with good coaching, good parenting, it, it, almost like the motivation for a kid is like make sure the kid has fun. Mm. Like in training, make sure after the training they get together, make sure so, they get so good. So all, all these aspects kind of needs to click. Yeah. So the parents are pushing, but not too much. The coaches are making. putting a pressure for competition, but not too much. Yes. So it's... Uh, doesn't becoming a demotivation factor, right? Yes. And at the same time, well, obviously you need to uh, kind of like the game, right? Correct. I mean, you got to be passionate about the game and you just got to... Uh, that's why there's a lot of people that play sports and only some of them make it because yeah. you really everything got to, you know, kind of uh, get together in the same place, same time, same, you know, perfect situation. But I think the motivation is for kids is making them have fun and enjoy what they're doing some way. You know, if it's too much, don't pressure. Like you said, you don't want to play today, don't play today. Like, you know, have the kid understand there's other things to do and be a kid uh, to keep them hungrier and hungrier, you know, about the sport. Yeah. Do you think, and now we will go to the CrossFit already. <laughs> yeah. Uh, do you think that the fact that it was a team sport was also very important? That you had that friends and pushback, that if it would be, I know, tennis or, uh, or uh, gymnastics or yes. yeah, something way more individual that it would be way harder to push through this. I a hundred percent think that if it wasn't a team, it would be a lot harder, but even single sports, you have your team and you still have your friends that train with you like jujitsu. It's a fight, right? But they have a good yeah. team of people that actually train with them. So that community makes a huge difference. But I think team sports, like I'll always tell to every parent, everybody like, If you can put your kid in a team sport for a little bit only, or maybe for the whole life, like you teach them so much, like that brotherhood that like, okay, like we need to serve also instead of just being the star, like the team yeah. sport for me is everything, you know? So being around my friends, they're also struggling with that pressure definitely helped. Mm -hmm. Cool. 
Okay, I, so a friend comes. Uh, you are uh, just to get one thing clear. You are twenty six right now. Yeah, thirty one. You're thirty. Why yeah. I thought you're twenty six. I look yeah. Anyway, I look good. My mistake. Yeah, <laughs> yes. you look good. <laughs> That's it for yeah. sure. Okay, so you're thirty one. You were around what age when you moved to US and you were introduced 18. to CrossFit? Oh uh, yeah, so I moved to US when I was eighteen. Okay, I got introduced to CrossFit when I was nineteen, twenty. So that was like early days of CrossFit. Very early. Very early. Around two thousand and we're in two thousand twelve, eleven to twelve. Okay, 12, around yeah, 12, yeah. yeah. So in US, that was already. Picking up, there was yeah. the. Uh, I always consider that uh, rich running games mm -hmm. uh, From championships that point, yeah. like that. That's like <laughs> the golden era, yeah. Like start 2010 and then the 2000 up to uh, 17, 18, and then I lost interest. But that's <laughs> that's, that's a different thing. topic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's my personal yeah, thing. Yeah. Uh, okay, so you were around 2021. Yeah, you introduced to CrossFit. Yeah, friends tell tells you that it's great because you uh, climb, throw, whatever Flip tires and all yeah. that. You and know. you just went and tried. Yeah, so I went and tried. I actually used to drive in a, in a world that I always see the CrossFit after he told me, and I was always seeing this place. And uh, and right when I was not training with the team, I was like, you know what, I need to be in shape. I'm not a I'm not a big, big, big fan of conventional gym. I do train, I do my stuff, but like I'm more of a team person. So anything that involves more community attracts me more. Uh, and I was like, okay, I'll I'll give it a try. Let me stop by. Right, I was driving, saw the place. Okay, let me let me just stop. Oh, where was this? That's in South Florida. Okay, Florida, Florida. Florida yeah, it okay. called the name of the play. The name of the gym is Cross It Hardcore. Back in the days, they were. <laughs> They classic were, classic know, crossfit what is day. cool right yeah. uh very big back in the days they ended up having a, 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 i think almost nine gyms and then you know whatever happened mm -hmm. they, they only have one or two now but they were very one of the first ones there and i and yeah i was driving in one of the locations and i stopped there did maybe a week trial if i'm not mistaken and after that week trial i joined their other location which was closer to my house Uh, but I did with them for a while and they're, yeah, but it was a very interesting introduction because I was fit, you know, and I kind of was put in a class that was not <laughs> looked well, you know, after, you know, when you're good at something, then you put it, you go into cross a class and then you get something that you're not good at, you're like, oh my God, what's happening, right? Yeah. So it was a very interesting first day for me. So you were good until you came to CrossFit, yeah? I thought, <laughs> you I, thought, I, you were I, thought I was fit. Yeah. Oh, hey, I, I have exactly... Uh, Exactly the same experience. Yeah. I was doing MMA. Okay. And I thought like, you know, come on, like nobody MMA, can stop me. you know, yeah, <laughs> nobody, nobody can uh, outfit you, you know? Yeah. And then I, and I remember this, I exactly remember this workout. It was uh, 30 push-ups, 400 meter run, 30 squats, 400 meter run, and 30 burpees, 400 meter run. Hey, on the last 400 meter run, I, I thought I would be faster if I walk, you know, like, so like everything I was like, and the psychological pain was even bigger because like, how is this messing me so much, you know? And just, and that, that was, that was it. I was like, shit, like if something is, if some people are great at this, like what kind of fitness they have to have, like there is something to be good in at that, it right? yeah like like if you're good at this oh my god like how how much better you will be in everything else right so so that's that, that was uh that, probably that was similar impression. yeah, yeah no, for many, me, many people have the i same think most story, people yeah. and now being a coach it's funny because we got to see from the other side people's first <laughs> yeah you know introduction but uh but yeah i was like my first class was a 400 meter run too and then it was uh box jumps And, uh, no, I'm sorry, 400 meter run, kettlebell swings and pull-ups. That's Helen. Uh, I don't think it was Helen. Okay. Because, but I mean, that's, yeah, the, it's around, yeah, yeah, it's, around it's, that, it's that around idea. The, yeah. the same idea because I think there was another movement, but I can't remember. I think it was either box jump or something, but for sure I, I'll remember the kettlebell and the pull-ups and the running. And I'll tell you why the running first, uh, first movement was the running. I was like, okay. Easy day. I'm a soccer player. <laughs> Let me show these people how to do it, right? <laughs> I show up with running shoes and all that. So made my 400 meter people like, what is this kid doing? And I'm fast. I used to be fast, right? Soccer players. And then I finished the 400. And then my scaling option for a pull-up was box pull-up. So I was okay. doing box pull-up, which is 
you know, when you know how to do a pull up, it's pretty simple. But for people that don't know how to do a pull up, it's as hard. You know, the box is pretty low. And I was like, so that's okay. the whole idea. You scale it up. Yeah. yeah and scale the, it down, the yeah. coach was very good to scale in a way that made it so difficult for me. The kettlebell very light. Anyways, the whole point is when I finished, uh, when they finish, some people are finishing first than me, right? So this lady, probably seven years old, she finished before me and she was doing exactly what i was doing <laughs> the box pull up and the kettlebell swing the same way and the running but there is a lot of older people that do crossfit very well right she was not like a just a random seven year old she was fit for a seven year old but still that's not a great ego boost I for you i was yeah? like 20 man come on and then at the end i couldn't do my pull-ups i was like my arms couldn't do it and she was like you can do it you can do it you can do it and I was like, you know, I was like, thank you very much. After, you know, at the end, like we kind of chat for a little bit. But then I went home. I was like, bro, there's something wrong. You know, like. So, just, so you had did 50, I do wrong or? 50 year older woman, lady cheering up on you. With the same with scaling. With the same exact workout. With the same scaling. It's not like she's doing something else. It's the same exact scaling. And then, That's I, brilliant. And then I was like, how is that possible, man? So I was like, that got to my head. And I'm, I'm very competitive. And I was like, just to prove to myself, I'm going to do this and I'm going to go ahead and be good at it, you know, so I can understand. And then I couldn't wash my hair the first <laughs> week, you know, those pains that you don't even know you have those muscles. And that amazed me. I was like, oh, my God, like, like you said, if somebody's good at that, what are they doing? How is the training, you know? And so that was my first impression. And, and I loved it. You know, it was very, very good. But humiliating a little bit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, humbling. That's yeah, the word. at least yeah, it got it got you into it and correct. Yeah. Oh, okay. So then you started to do CrossFit to supplement your strength and conditioning yeah. for the soccer. Yes. So yeah. I was doing that a little bit, like a couple times a week, just to kind of help me with the soccer. And then after I stopped playing soccer, that that was my main uh, that was my main fitness routine. Basically, mm -hmm. you know, I kind of stopped going to the gym. I was like, no, this is enough. Like I'll just focus on this. You know? Okay. And how you got from, uh, let's say, you know, recreational CrossFitter to really doing it, right? on, yeah. really doing it. Uh, I'm, I'm very, in, yeah, I'm very intense on what I do, uh, which basically, uh, the, what you might call it, the, any sport or anything that I do, I make sure I go full force. So when I start doing CrossFit automatically in the first week, in the first few weeks, I was like, okay, who's the best one in the world of this shit? <laughs> you know, who's good at, like, who's real good? And then Rich Froney, all those Kalipa, you know, like uh, Panchek and all those guys, yeah. uh, Josh Bridges. And uh, and I was like, even Chris Spieler, which I was like super fan of because his body type is so, you know, little and, and he's so strong, right? Yeah. And uh, I was like, okay, so these guys are the good ones. Okay, cool. So what do they do? And then I was like, and they're like, okay, no, they do extra training or they do something else. So my gym used to offer the what, we, what they call AIT, which is athletes in training. So okay. I was I was already okay. I want that too. You know, like I, I want to be. I want to go to the games. Right. I want to go to regionals, whatever. And even, it took even me. People... It took me like a year, less than a year, to be like, okay, I want to do this for a living. On my head, right? Okay. Even though I didn't even get close, okay. but like so many people, even they don't admit it aloud, always had this in their head. I was like, bro, I wanted no, like, to. I, yeah. yeah, I was like, Rich Funny, who? Like, this <laughs> yeah. is what I had in my mind, you know? I thought I was going to go to the games for sure, you know? And then when you start getting compliments from the coaches, oh, you're good at box jumping. Like, that's it. You know, like I'm, I'm already thinking that I'm going to regionals. And I, stuff. I'm going to win regionals you know? and box jumps. <laughs> that's it. Exactly. Right. That's the only thing I'm good at. <laughs> No, I was I was very well fit. Like I, I'm a competitive person. Like you know, a year ago, last year, without even training so much, ended up going to quarterfinals. Like I can I can make some noise, right? But uh, but definitely not my my goal. But uh, yeah, I had that in mind to become that. So then I was like, okay, it's not that easy, or to go, and it, it's gonna take a little bit of time. How can I be more involved in CrossFit? And then I think the easiest path back in the days which I don't even remember how judges were treated back then. I don't even know if they had like something like judging. Cause nowadays, if you want to get into more, you can become a judge and kind of go to competitions and feel that little vibe of being around the community. Right. But the coaching was the option. So I was like, either you open a gym or you coach. That's how you get more involved in being an athlete. Right. Yeah. So I took my level one very early and didn't pass first time. 
but I was like, no studying. I was like, no, it's level one. I'll do it. It's easy. No problem. And then it, I passed it. The next time I did it, I passed it. But, but I yeah, went. Don't through. underestimate level one. Yeah. No, no, please don't. <laughs> Especially if English is you not know, your first language. It's very difficult. Very. Yeah. Because they don't test if you know, they test if you understand. And it's very different. Completely. And That's not, a great point. not the language, but the language of CrossFit, the the understanding of the whole concept, right? Like all the questions or many questions are put in a way that you really need to know what is behind it. It's not A, B, C, D. Which super, one makes super, more sense. Yes. yes. Yeah. It's not, uh, is it either or? It's what is the best answer to this question? A, B, and yeah. C are correct, yes. but which one is the most efficient one? Exactly. But, uh, but yeah, so I got introduced like like I said, I'm very intense on everything that I do. Becoming into CrossFit and doing a local competition and winning local competitions and stuff like that made me want to become a coach right away. So like I like it it took me less than a year and a half to be like a coach, like around that area, you know, this stuff. Mm -hmm. So very quick. Cool. Yeah. Uh what did you find what were you struggling with the most when you started to coach? Was there something would you remember part in Besides particular? Besides language not being the first, right? Because <laughs> I was like, you know, back in the days, my English was not completed, but that was one of the struggles. Mm -hmm. And um, other struggle that I had uh, was basically, uh, I had good people around me that kind of put me, you know, gave me good energy and stuff like that. So I'm blessed enough to, I had a good background of head coaches and owners that kind of helped me out. Uh, but I think was just, um, and I'm, I want, I was very honest too. Like I'll be in a class and be like, guys, I don't know what this means, but I'm here to help you and we're going to do it together. So the members kind of connected that way. Nice. And I feel like every coach and I'm going to answer your question, but uh, it's fine. Go yeah, on, no, go no, on. but meaning like I want, I still want to answer, but I want to get uh, to the side a little. Mm -hmm. When you're a coach, the way you connect with your crew and your people is being honest. Most people there are in your class. They don't know anything. It's like if you like myself, if I bring if I bring my car to the mechanic, I don't know anything. They can say anything, right? Yeah. And uh it, I'll just remove the cat. Yeah, we'll we, keep have going. Visitor, we have a visitor. <laughs> yeah. It it's okay. And uh and uh and uh what I was saying was uh all the coaches, they are they need to be honest where they at and i was always honest since day one this is as much as i know i'm not sure what that means i don't know what this is and that made me connect very quickly with the members instead of like i was saying the car if you bring my car to mechanic they can say anything and i'll trust and i feel like athletes are like that members they go to the class and if you tell them that you do the difference of the you know reverse lunge and the front lunge it's whatever you say they're going to trust you yeah. so but it's better for you to not say anything and be honest with your crew, then just start creating stuff. And I was never afraid to tell them, I'm not sure. You know, yeah. what's the difference of this? What, what, you know? Well, the most what you build is the trust, right? Because you're not afraid and that, to that's admit. that's usually the biggest challenge for other coaches. Absolutely. And, you know, that's why it wasn't for me, you know? And you go home, you do your research, and you come with an answer, with an answer next time, and that's, that's how it's done, right? That, that, that's how you learn. Yeah. And next time they ask you, they're going to know if you're being honest or not. Yeah, right? exactly. And uh, you will actually, well, th that's the best way, right? Because uh, if you'll just uh, bullshit your way around it, you will start to believe that bullshit as it well. It can be done, but yeah, yeah exactly what happened. <laughs> you believe in your own stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know? And then just like, but I just want to uh, highlight one thing. And that's uh, when you say it like this, it might not be obvious, but I, I think this is a, very huge thing what you've done in the meaning of you are in a foreign country for you for kind of home but foreign country not yeah. home at all but yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah you speak different language you come to this thing you only at that point i believe could take the test and the whole crossfit mm -hmm. uh, level one in english language yeah so you did it in, no in the yeah. foreign language which like all right I also did my level one in English because mm -hmm. that was the only option. However, you stay there and you coach in that language. You know, like I did my level one, but I came back and I was coaching in my own language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, that's uh, 
that's super, super tough because after, after years of being efficient in coaching in my language, I got to teach in English. And as I told you before we started yeah. the recording, it was a huge challenge. I was like, I reduced everything what I was saying to 20%, just basic instruction. <laughs> yeah. Just like basically a survival mode. Like yeah. I just told them what they really need to know because I had to think about how do I say it in English and how do I make it better? Do always questioning, am I expressing it the right way? Because you might think it's how it's said, but in it might not be the textbook language that is the most efficient to use in the gym, true, right? True. And then, as we always say, the cue that uh, the the good cue is the cue that works. And now you have cue that doesn't work, and you, in a foreign language, need to come up with some shit that will work. Rephrase that it. They will yeah? understand. Like yeah. just say one sentence in a foreign language, and then like, okay, say the same thing three more times, always different way. Like it's super hard, right? Very, very difficult. Yeah. No, it was definitely a challenge. It, it definitely helped me become the person that I am and the the coach that I am by being exposed to different community. And that's one of the reasons that I came here. It's to again be exposed. There are classes that I coach now that they barely speak English. It's just locals. So, you know, I got to figure out another way of doing it. So, and I love that challenge, right? But, but. What, what does your t shirt say? Uh, Do you know? My man, I think that's the name of the brand. Okay. Amongst Fuel. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. I think so. They asked it because I was walking the other day with the shirt and they got, the locals were like pointing. I was like, what does that mean? Is that your name? I was like, no, no, that's the brand. And they're like, oh, this is what it says. So I think oh, it's the right. name of the brand. Okay. Yeah, okay. I hope so. Because like, there's no way I can. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, Maybe I... it's saying some shit. If it is, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I have nothing to do with this. I just thought it was a cool shirt. Uh, but but yeah, uh, no, I think, man, when you, when you do stuff like that, and for all the coaches out there, you just got to be honest with yourself. And there's no problem about not knowing stuff. And there's no problem about struggling with the language or or being uncomfortable in a situation as long as you're honest with that and always try to grow and make it better exactly yeah Go like home and if do you don't study. know to, if you don't know today that's fine but if you don't put any effort in into knowing tomorrow yes that's problem as exactly. well exactly and the community will connect to you if you're honest with them but yeah the language was probably for me was probably one of the biggest uh challenges that i had and also uh being like People like having the responsibility that people will do exactly what you tell them to do. Mm -hmm. And like, like you literally, I remember there was one time that I will never do it again. It was a mistake that I did very young age on coaching it was like, there was a guy who was from uh, Korea or he was from Korea, South Korea. And then that day showed me how much like our presence and how much we coaches have responsibility under the people's life right this guy was like okay i want to do a pull up with the band and this guy did a pull up with the band and i and he was my friend he's still my friend that's why i did it he was, i was like okay you gotta do the pull up with the band but you gotta make sure the band hit your nose every time like you know when you do a pull okay. up with the band yeah, which is so, like so you stretch it forward yeah yeah, yeah but yeah. meaning like but you don't have to eat your nose like you can put your hands to the, your head yeah. to the side and the kid was doing that like during the class, my my friend and I was like, no, no, no. So I came to him. I was like, no, I was just joking. But that day showed me, <laughs> that day showed me that like we coaches have a lot of responsibilities in what we do and what we say. So if you want to become a coach, you got to make sure you're ready for that. And if you're if you are a coach, words have a lot of power. And like whatever you say, your members will basically uh, believe you. So it's a big thing, like trust, you know, and automatically, as an example, when I came to UAE, first day that I was introduced as a coach, I immediately have 20 people that trust 100% on me. How crazy. Seeing that. your first time. You know, yeah. not even knowing me. Just out of authority of the position. Right? Yeah. So like, it's a big responsibility for me to tell them what to do. And I'm literally dealing with their life, you know, so uh, with their life. So it's just... Uh, yeah, so being honest uh, where you at is very, very important for a you, coach. Uh, do you know the the CrossFit meme king uh, make the world great again? It sounds familiar. Okay, so yeah. it, it's just, it's, a, it's this guy on the Instagram. He's just doing mm -hmm. uh, all CrossFit-related memes, mm -hmm. yeah? 
Uh, I think he actually he's uh, he personally knows a lot of uh, famous air quotes <laughs> people yeah, yeah. in a CrossFit space. He knows the media. He mm-hmm. he knows some athletes, and he's just in that space. And uh, I just remember you reminded me exactly with this when you, when you said in a very young age you said something that wasn't that was meant as a joke, but it was taken literally. Mm-hmm. So he's he had this meme. Can't remember what was on it, but it was some kind of maybe some. A uh, shot from uh, superhero movies, or you know, just like some somebody extremely dominant just posing on the picture, and the description was like, "This is how these twenty-year-old kids taking one weekend seminar of CrossFit Level One are feeling on the class." That is so funny. <laughs> All the power, you know, yes. you have so much power. You, it's it's dangerous. It is dangerous. That that's so funny. I would like to see that. You show me that later. Yeah, but yeah. that's so funny because that's very true. You know, and that's uh, I mean. For people that care, that's that's a big responsibility. And for people that don't care, the problem is when there's a coach that kind of don't care about that, they might utilize that in a wrong way, or they might use it uh, utilize that in a wrong way without knowing. So just know that whenever you're leading a class, there's a full responsibility. Literally, you have the power of tell them anything, you know. So, yeah. and the good side of it is if you do the right thing, then you set for life. Because then anywhere you go, you have a lot of people that are your fans, the people that love you, people that really, like, you can change people's lives if you yep. think about it, right? So it's, yeah. it's, it's, a, lot of, it's a lot of power. <laughs> Got to use the right way. Sometimes too much. <laughs> too much. Yeah. yeah. Too uh, early, too much, too early. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, you were coaching and then you eventually became head coach? Correct. So yep. mm-hmm, I, be, I was a coach. Uh, I was coaching and then I became a head coach. And then I... That's where I gained all my experience for about five years in the same gym. Okay, when we say when we say you became a head coach, I mean like that mm-hmm. way simpler said than done. Yeah. Right. So yeah. what, what was it. the next day? No, no, no. <laughs> just took, uh, they took a vote and yeah. like, yeah, we like this guy. <laughs> so what was the process there? Like, uh, like, what were, which what, happens, by the way. But what were we, the requirements? Uh, basically, in my gym that I was doing, uh, I was coaching. I was, I think, was I was the oldest coach on mm-hmm. the place and the owner was the head coach okay so there was a lot of intern process that i did for about eight months where he was literally not judging me every class but he was literally making sure that i did you know start with the programming and start doing member relationship and all that and for about eight months i was built to become a head coach and i was already being a head coach without being called a head coach and that's when he's like okay it's time Meaning okay. like you, you took all the roles a little by little. And, you know, I've, I've learned everything from this guy. Uh, and he was a very good mentor of mine. And he, he taught me everything. And the way that he kind of spread that in the long term, it really made sense for me to become a head coach. I, I believe that that might be the best way to do it, right? Because you have the responsibilities, you're already doing it. And... You don't just out of nowhere gain all that power <laughs> and the responsibility at one day just because like, okay, now from this day, you're a head coach and this is everything what you have to deal with. Uh, I was in a little bit similar mm-hmm. uh, situation, but there was a little bit more administrative stuff and kind of, let's say, politics mm-hmm. involved because uh, in here... Uh, in Dubai, when I came here, I was a coach, and then uh, our head coach left for Christmas and never came back. Yeah, he had he had the uh, gym back still home. Still on vacation. <laughs> yeah, so he's still there. Uh, he had the uh, gym back home. He just decided that he will stay there and focus on that because while he was here, his girlfriend was running it, mm-hmm. so he just decided to stay. But there was some admin stuff with his position because it wasn't officially closed because. He just said it from UK that he's done. So he didn't kind of finish the job properly with the passport Mm -hmm. and everything. And there is some kind of a grace period of six months. So, Mm -hmm. but somebody needed to be head coach, right? And uh, I said like, okay, guys, like if you need me, I'm here. That wasn't really hurt, but there was still, there was still something that needed to be done, right? programming and organizing different stuff and so i started to volunteer for this kind of stuff it was always put in in front of us who wants to do do this yeah Yeah. 
I always volunteered. And then I remember this very well. There was another guy who was supposed to come to be the head coach. He was that time level three. And I was working. I was just signing up to, for my level three exam. Yeah, but nobody knew. I didn't tell anybody until I did it. And uh, this, uh, this guy, he was supposed to come. But if you remember the open workout with a lot of hands and push, basically Diane, mm. and then following with Diane and hands, or like same hands scheme, but the handstand walk with heavier deadlift. Yeah, 315. So, yeah, yeah, so yeah. So this guy blew his back on this workout and he herniated his disc and he was waiting for some ozone therapy, which was yeah. interesting for me to learn. I didn't know. They just inject ozone into your, well, not spine, but yeah. in the area. Yeah. So it pushes the disc back. Wow. Yeah. So there was, he was waiting for that, but he was already supposed to come. And I just remember I was sitting in the office when the management, I was there with them when they got the email, like he's, so you're he's, present, fu yeah. he's fucked up and they just looked at each other. Like, did you see the email? And they was like, Oh my God, what do we do? You uh -huh. know, panic mode. But, uh, cause I was already doing quite of that stuff within the next couple of weeks. I was also kind of officially mm -hmm. put into that position, but. 100%, 100% believe that it should be gradual and it should be something you over time kind of deserve, you know, because you already do the responsibilities, you are already there. The people who are in charge of naming you to the position, they can see if you're fucking up or it's okay or how, how well you're doing, eventually help you to do it better, right? And then kind of regulate the whole process without the hype of, but this is my role. Yeah, you know? and, and that's a that's a that's a great point. And I believe that a head coach and a coach, they should be people that care. So teaching how to coach, that's easy, but you can't teach how to care. Yep, caring is either you have or you don't, right? So I think it's a lot of waste of time making coaches that don't care become coaches. Yeah, and I, head coaches as well. When I used to have interviews for coaching mm -hmm. positions. Uh, I was always asking them this question. You have the six fundamental areas of coaching, right? Taught by CrossFit mm -hmm. at level two, seeing, teaching, uh, correcting. correcting, yeah, or teaching, seeing, mm -hmm. correcting. So that's like the, the basic stuff, right? That like mm -hmm. that needs to be there. And then you have the demonstration, Application. Uh, group management, mm -hmm. group management, and uh, maybe they changed it, but there was mm. group management demonstration basically being able to show it to mm -hmm. show it to the class and then the last one presence and attitude and mm -hmm. i i list them down as like which one is the most important you know and there's not right and wrong answer course, yeah, but yeah. it will tell you what How is the priority yeah. for people you know and sometimes they'll say like well seeing is the most important it's like why well because that's what i struggle with you know and that might be the answer however for me Mm -hmm. the, for me personally, the answer is a uh, presence and attitude because all of the other things, as you said, you can teach that. You can teach how to see movement. You can teach how to coach. You can teach how to uh, do a better time management, but you cannot teach the attitude and the care. Yeah. So exactly a hundred percent with you on that. People who are in a position of even, I, I want to, mm -hmm. uh, uh, sound bad to these people like yeah, diminishing it of but like a regular coaches even that you should do the extra mile always you should always go the extra mile because if somebody's struggling on the class and you don't go after and you don't offer them help and it doesn't have to be for free it doesn't have to be like okay so uh, now i will give up my saturday to teach you uh, to teach you mm -hmm. squat better or to teach you how to feel your hamstrings on this move. it's like no it can just be as simple as i see you struggling if you need help i'm here I'm for here. you yes yeah but that's many times it's not happening it's clock in coach clock out but yes, I think the extra mile, it's definitely going to be paid off in some way. And I think the caring for coaches, it, it is a must. And and especially from coaches to head coaches, because head coaches are leading the coaches and the, the classes too, and the community too, right? So, and to become a leader, uh, like to become a good leader, in my point of view, you have to care about your team 
more than you care about yourself. There's a lot of like you, the ego part is big. It's like the people, how your team feels, how your coaches feel and how your members feel. It has to be first before of how you feel. And that's how I think you lead a good team. So for a person to get to that level, doesn't matter what level three, four, five you have or degree, if you don't have that kind of attitude and present and, and presence in the, in the gym, I don't think you deserve to become a head coach. Not because you're bad. You can be a great coach, but leading other coaches involves a lot more. Like it's just not like it's not a position just for your ego. You know, I, I actually have a great example from a real life situation, and this is. This is not even from the coaching environment, mm -hmm. but this is from, let's say, oh, let's say it's a healthcare thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't want to be specific in naming uh, people and places. However, I was uh, was brought into my attention that there was this situation, and from the leadership perspective, I was just talking about this with few people. There was a situation where two therapist with a very very specific set of skills so they are in their place irreplaceable so they kind of booked a holiday day for the same day and it was an administrative mess up and it was brought into attention of the leaders First, yeah. yeah who were in charge that okay so well They told them, sort it out between you, but one of you needs to be there on this day. Like, we cannot have this position uncovered for that one Regardless day. Regardless of who it is. Yeah. yeah. However, the crazy part about that, that the leader who said this has that set of skills as well. So sh she or he could just say, you know what, guys? Like... It was a mess up from our side. You go on your holiday. You go on your holiday. That one day, it's on me. I will cover it. Exactly. You know? And that is exactly what leaders should do. For, for me, I, I believe you know who Simon Sinek is. Mm -hmm. Simon Sinek, the leadership uh, coach. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, leaders, uh, he wrote the book Leaders Eats Last mm -hmm. and a couple of more. So this is exactly it. Leaders Eats Last. You are given power and like, it's so easy to lead when everything goes well. Yeah. It's so easy to, you know, sunshine and, rain, uh, and rainbow mm -hmm. when everything is going very well and everything is right. But when the, when the problem starts, when there is some challenge, that's where it will be shown who is fit for that position and who is uh, just fulfilling the role. Right. And this is exactly, exact that. In that moment, you are the one to step in. You are the one to cover that day and prevent it from happening next time. But don't tell them, even like, that's probably the worst thing to tell them, figure out between you. I mean, like, come on, you know, yes. <laughs> it's and, not and, their responsibility. And, and, and that's exactly correct. And as a leader, uh, looking at this situation, the person has to be, Like the first thing that should come to their mind, it is I got it or, or it was our fault. And and honestly, even going a little deeper, even if it was their fault, I'll be like, guys, just be careful next time. I got you. Like, because Exa then you, de Absolutely. And then you develop yeah. that you put yourself in a position that now they they look at you in a different way. And how much trust do you gain? Right. And you then know? when you will need to put out their skin for you, they'll be way more willing to that do is, it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So, so a leader have to be it's a it's a very specific role and and I like the, to become a coach you have to care it to become a head coach you have to be a leader like those and it, and it's just not for everybody man and yep. it's okay if it, you know This is exactly what Simon Sinek is saying mm -hmm. uh, I'm just mentioning him because I don't want to steal the quote from his yeah. <laughs> uh, from him yeah uh he's saying that being a leader is the same as being a parent Not everybody wants to be, not everybody should be, and not everybody is capable of being a good leader mm -hmm. or a good parent. And there's nothing wrong about it. Yeah. It's just knowing if there is that capacity or if there is not. And of course, you, you learn on your own mistakes as well. But as we said before, okay, you can mess up, but learn from it and yeah. be better next time. And, and, and if you, and if you, if you're, 
every leader needs great team players. So you might not be a leader, but you can be a great team player. Yep. Like you can be a great uh, front desk. You can be a great coach, you know, like, so just make sure you, 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 you go for what you're good at it when you find that out and don't yeah. worry about it, like the higher position. Cause it's better to be a great coach than a bad head coach. Yeah. You know, for sure. Yeah. Well, Cause every coach is like, Oh, I want to be a head coach. Right. They, they think like this is the next, it might not be. I actually, I actually was in a situation where a couple of uh, people told me like, nah, That's not what I want. That's too oh. much. That's too much time. Too much responsibility. Awesome that they, I said that they know that. The best thing you can actually, not the best thing you can say, but it's the best thing you can say if you feel that way. You know, not You're just so pushing. honest with yourself. Yeah. yeah. And you know, and that awesome. helps. That helps everybody, right? Because you know what you are good at, and yeah. Well, I had a coach. I it. had a coach too before that I wanted to promote her head coach. She's like, no, no, no. I just want to be a coach. And believe me, whoever is the head coach, count on me because I'm here for you. Like, damn, you know, <laughs> this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> this you is know? exactly people you need. Yeah. Right. And at the same time, mm -hmm. it also comes with in the team. Sometimes you need to let people go as well. Because some, sometimes people just not fit. Sometimes you are in a position where the people outgrow the role in a way that not necessarily they need to go higher. They just need to go somewhere else yeah. because they don't want to be, they actually don't want to be there. They're just complacent yes. because they're already there. Yeah. And stealing, not stealing code from anybody, but a good guy that I follow a lot and I consider, uh, almost like as a mentor that don't know me, but I follow a lot is Gary V. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you heard about Gary V. I heard I a lot. Everybody, <laughs> everybody listens from Gary V at some point, right? He's all over the place. But he says like, there's a, there's an order that works for him. And, and I think it's fascinating the way he says, which is you should hire fast. You should fire faster. Okay. And you should promote the fastest. Meaning, Hire fast. Don't wait too long. Don't make such a big deal to hire, mm -hmm. right? Hire that, right? Hire that person. Okay. And fire faster. Yeah. Like fire that person next day if you have to, meaning like it's okay. Just keep going, you know, mm -hmm. and promote fastest. Meaning if you have a leader and if you have a person that's good, you don't have to be forcing that person to be in a way that, okay, now you have to, like the guy that put me in a position to become a head coach, he mm -hmm. told me, you're going to become a head coach. I'm just going to bring you there. Yeah. So it's not like, okay, no, you got to gain my trust for a year for then. I think, no, like if you have a leader. It wasn't like a hell week test for you. <laughs> yeah, like it's, exactly, exactly. So like, I think like if you kind of go through that order and I think it, it makes sense, like, okay, Like as a gym owner, right? You hire fast coach. You like mini has potential and obviously the credentials and everything doesn't work. Fire faster and get a new one. Like instead of being too much of a, of a, a movie. Oh my God. Like it's, it, there's process and for everything. But if you have a, such a special person, like as a gym owner, if you have a leader, why would you going to hold that leader on the position that he can actually grow and make you better? Right. And I think going a little deeper in that, like gym owners, like we I'll, I'll just say this, a lot of gym owners are not good leaders, which is okay. But make sure you hire a good leader, which there's a lot yeah. of problem with the gym owner with the ego part is like, you got to start understanding delegating as a company. Like you got to hire s smarter people than you. You got to be the dumbest in your company because that's the best thing because then your company grows. Right. Yeah. And then if you hire, if you're not a good coach, Or your gym owner, good. That's what I, I believe. This is what uh, Steve Jobs said, right? Like some engineers came to him and was like, "So what do you want us to do?" And he's like, "No, no, no. You tell me what you want, what yeah. you want me to yeah. do. I hired you to tell me that. Yeah, yeah. like exactly. I didn't hire you to just follow, uh, yeah. follow whatever I say. Like you need I to be learn innovative. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's exactly like that. You gotta hire smarter people than you. And gym owners, like it's gym owners, think. And it's put automatically in a position because the society that the gym owner usually is the head coach, which is the most respected person, which you usually think sometimes it's not like, uh, like I don't like to do office stuff. If I'm a gym owner, I'm going to hire somebody right away. Right. And, and I don't want to be in every single class. So I'm going to hire coaches that want to be in every single class. I'm not a good leader. I don't talk nice with my members. I got a head coach to be a leader. You know what I'm saying? And you're still a gym owner. <clears throat> but you got to understand that as a gym owner, it's also a leader. You got to understand that you got to create that team and make sure that you build that. 
you know so it's just like everybody have their own position you know yeah. which they're all valuables Th this is like uh, it reminds me i i had a podcast with my friend mike mm -hmm. and he used to be special forces operator mm -hmm. and he told me like there was i i don't want to mess this up but i believe there was eight guys in their in their squad like a small unit and he was like yeah there is a medic there is a breacher there is this and this and everybody has a special role and his special role was that he knew how to put them all together and that was the special skill that was the special skill he had that he might not be as efficient in uh, treating injury or doing whatever of the specialty he has definitely some basic knowledge mm -hmm. of all of them so eventually he could replace to a certain degree each position but that's why the specialists are there so he doesn't have to but he is delegating who is where doing what and making the tough decisions yeah that is great and yeah i think alibaba or aliexpress the website mm -hmm. i don't know if you heard about it it's one of the biggest uh websites oh yeah yeah, I yeah, know, yeah so so i think i it's either uh, maybe the guy owns both i don't know but i remember him doing an interview i believe he owns he both, owns both yeah. right i and i saw him saying like i don't know about selling i don't know about technology i don't know but i know how to put everybody together and make it happen yeah. <laughs> you know so it's just like there's exactly the same role you mm -hmm. know like an nba coach you're not going to teach lebron james how to play basketball but you got to make sure that they all work as a team like it's such a specific you know yeah a specific role and i think it's it's much needed yeah i was uh i was listening to this is a little bit of topic but i was listening to this uh kind of analysis of human nature and uh, politics this was from some uh, i believe he was a cia operator mm -hmm. and he was saying that when when we started as a human race yeah mm -hmm. uh, we first were everybody was doing everything at home you were cutting your own wood you were making your own shoes you know like everybody was kind of self-sufficient mm -hmm. then the next stage within a tribe was that okay we start to specialize it a little bit okay so we start to specialize in a way that okay so well you are way better at uh, at making uh, working with metal so you do that and i will trade you for this and you know so everybody had their own special role and then basically where politics came was when these people needed to be ruled where these people needed to be policed so there are no conflicts in between them and somebody who was able to manage them so everybody is doing what is the most beneficial for the community what is the problem these days is that on a bigger scale these people who are in these leading positions are there many times because they don't have any other skill they can't work with metal they can make the shoes they can't do anything useful so they go to politics yeah of course if the politician or the leader of that uh, whatever tribe village mm -hmm. is somebody whose true and genuine skill is communication efficiency creating structure brilliant that will work but if somebody is going to that position because he's a lazy fuck who is not able to do anything yeah well that's where all the problem starts right because what will happen what will actually uh be the main point of that guy in the office to keep the office to stay in the game mm -hmm. because if he's out of there if he's out of that leadership role he can't do anything useful therefore he's disposable and that that's uh, that's where interesting yeah Very that's interesting. where all yeah. these structures come into place and you just realize that oh my god like these guys are there because they know shit <laughs> you know? so funny right many of them i yeah. of course not everybody of course. but many of them yeah a big percentage yeah yeah that's very interesting but many times also uh, a couple of times in history it happened that countries for whatever political reasons they were led by professionals you know i, I don't know what they uh, call it in english but it's basically that you 
your positions of, you know, Minister of Education, Minister of Healthcare, whatever, mm -hmm. are filled not with political nominees, but professional nominees. It's only done for a temporary time. But I mean, like, why? Why is it done only for, you know, why, why the whole mm -hmm. structure is not created about that actual people who understand medicine are in a healthcare, actual people who are mm -hmm. from the educational standpoint, the best are leading the educational departments. Like we, we, we do such a stupid things that we put people who have no idea about that field. They just have big mouth and they can make you believe that they are the best, but you know, and these periods of time where these professional uh, governments of professionals were in charge, they became the most prosperous times of that countries. But, mm -hmm. you know, power struggle, whatever, and then they are swiped back because that's only usually done as an emergency temporary solution until election or until Correct. something. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, like, come on, you know? I know. But on a, on a micro scale of your daily life, like, who do you want to manage your health? Who do you want to manage your True. economy, right? Like, somebody who talks about it or somebody who has a result in that field simple yeah, like as that like a cheerleader right yeah but on a macro scale we just vote for it yeah. <laughs> that's a very good point of view makes total sense and it can it's the same in a gym yes it's you know? same always the once there is a hierarchy it's yeah. basically similar patterns everywhere okay so anyway uh, back to your story how did you then became a gym owner so the way it was I was a head coach in this gym uh, for about five uh, years. Then right after uh, I got to a position where I was literally uh, doing everything in a gym and not making the money as the owner, right? So, you know, I had a proposal of either becoming a partner or opening a new gym or because financially I wanted to get, you know, more money because I was already running the gym. And then he, that wasn't his goal. His goal was to keep a small gym where, you know, the way, the way he's still up to today, which is great. I right? mm -hmm. still love the guy, but it was not my vision, right? Okay, so you came with the proposal to yeah. do something yeah, differently. Yeah, because okay. I was like, okay, how can I make more money? Mm -hmm. You know, yep. and, and like, am I like, okay, the next step of a head coach is become an owner, right? And then I was like, okay. And then there was no opportunity for me to become owner there, right? So I was like, okay. So then... Uh, I approached another gym. Actually, a good friend of mine told this gym about me. And this gym was like, okay, no, we know him. How about we get him to come over here? And so I ended up doing a meeting with them. And, and I was like, okay, listen, I'm happy where I'm at. I'm my head coach. I know everybody. I run the place. Like, I, I'm not interested in moving to do the same thing in a different place. Like, I only can be here if I become an owner. Right. Or like a part owner or give me a percentage or I work and then I pay my part with working something. Right. Like, okay, how about you come work for us as a head coach, uh, make everything happen. Give us about three to six months. Let's put four months and then we have a seat. And then after six months with you, us and we make you a proposal of, of how much percent you want and stuff like that. And then we make it happen. I right? never thought about it, but why not, right? We want somebody to have something, that's, you know, a skin in the game. And I was like, perfect. So I ended up being there uh, right in the COVID. Um, as soon as co <laughs> I started coaching, had coaching there, and three days after lockdown, right? <laughs> and then, but anyways, but it was fine because I was good opportunity because I renovated the whole gym. But this was in Florida, right? Florida. You did. You didn't really care about the no, rules it was, much, right? No, it wasn't. No, it too was strict. It was like two or three months mandatory for the whole world, but like we only we only stay locked down. Like I kept going to the gym every day. Like okay. No masks for me. Like I like I didn't. Florida was very liberal, right? With that, yeah. but the gym had to close because you know. Okay. Uh, I think all the business kind of closed for a little bit. Uh, the minimum, and then they close, and then I, yeah, I ended up doing my first mentoring role without knowing that I was doing my mentoring role, and without even thinking, I renovated the whole gym. They never got me as a mentor, right? I renovated the whole gym, uh, painted the whole gym, 
bought a bunch of equipment, sold a bunch of equipment, did a lot of documents for them. Like I basically restructured the whole gym in a sense that, like, you know, like I'll be basically, you know, I was telling the owners what to do and stuff like that. And now that I, you know, that I actually do this, I was like, okay, that was my first actual without even knowing, right? Mm -hmm. So I created a lot of stuff. So I, I was there for three months. So you did it from your position of a head, head, head coach who is uh, on the lockdown. Yeah. <laughs> and you can't I, have I, people there. So let's yes. at least and do I still, something good for the place. That yeah. is correct. Because mm -hmm. I can be stopped. Like if I'm, if you pay me, like, okay, how can I help? Right. Yeah. But then we still do like online classes, right? Like mm -hmm. we're still coaching, but online. But I was like, okay, how about we, okay, how many sandbags you have? One, we don't need them then. Throw away, like, like trying to reorganize the whole place to make more sense. Painted, bought new barbells, got a PVC hole, like, like did a fantastic job on that, which is up to today, look the same. Changed the programming, bought a TV, uh, came up with a couple ideas for marketing, like get the Instagram, like did everything that I could on the time that I had, right? I want to give them value. And they were super happy with it. But then when I was there doing my thing, I got a call from another friend of mine, coach, that was a coach at this gym that was in lockdown too. Mm -hmm. And she's like, Luan, there's a great opportunity for you to, for us to buy the gym that I'm at, not the one that I was. Mm -hmm. And the one that I was- Another gym. Another gym. And the one that I was, I was like, okay, guys, I, I need at least 20 to 30 20, 15 to 30, 35, the most percent of this gym before we get into that. Like, okay, we talk about percentage, give us about four months. Like, okay, cool. They're going to pay me the same money that I get paid there. It's fine. Then after that, we have a contract already that they must talk to me about it. Good, we're good. And she's like, okay, it's going to be 50 50. And then I was like, okay, that's different, right? 50 is more than 25. Yeah, <laughs> right. And then what I did, I was like, and she was like, and zero down because there is an investor. And then I was like, hold on a second. So even better, right? Like there was- And a, that was already running gym? Or it was, was like, gym. let's go open a new no, one? No, no, that was already, was already established. Yeah. But then there was, a, it's a big story. I'll go, I'll go deeper uh, with you later. But basically uh, I was like, okay, guys, listen, there's 50% here. Like you guys offered me that. I want to stay here. You know, I like that person in the gym too, but like I'm, I'm literally looking for financials now. Like I gave you my word that I want to be here and I want to be with you, but- I cannot compare 50 to 25%. Yeah. Like, can you guys match that? Would you guys do 50% for me? And, and then they were like, no, I understand. I'm, we're very sad that you're leaving and kind of upset in a way. And I understand. I get it, right? Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, like, it doesn't make sense for you to stay 20, 50, right? So I ended up going there and buying the gym with her, right? Lockdown, which was another gym that was also not happening. Like, not, not you know, no classes, only online. But I saw the opportunity. So we bought with 110, 110 members paying uh, without going to support the community that everybody was kind of having that a little bit of like some of the members were paying and stuff like that. And we were like renting the, the rowers, giving people the yeah. barbell. So we we're like trying to keep alive. And then we bought it with a very good price. Uh, so uh, I was like, okay. So then I bought that with my partner. And then right before I came here, I sold it with like almost 400 members. So it was a success, you know, it's killing it there. So within three years and a half, three years and yeah. a half, you quadrupled yeah. the numbers. Yeah. There. Yeah. Wow. It was amazing. It was that's, amazing. Uh, that's epic. Of me and my partners, obviously, and the whole team that we created, like we, we got, we'd only cross it classes. Now I left there with like 11 coaches and like five different programs, booty class, uh, functional <laughs> strength, uh, yoga, there was a cardio day. Like I created so much a boot camp. Like we both created a lot of, a lot of stuff. It's a like now the gym. As soon as I left, they have like a bodybuilding area for the gym now. Like it's it everything that you need is there. So nice. we did we did our job, you know. So that's how I became gym owner, basically. Oh, yeah. Long story short. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> okay. So then, the question you will definitely not be able to answer: What is the secret to? quadruple the numbers in three and a half years while two of them are in, within the pandemic. <laughs> right, I know, exactly. Uh, I think for CrossFit, uh, the secret was literally being genuine uh, and because people feel your energy and we really, really, really cared about our members. Like that, that, that was our priority. And when you really care about your members they feel 
And not only that, I have an entrepreneur side of me and I have a leadership on me that I love making my team feel even better than the members, right? So it's just like my goal and my main skill set, it is to give and help people and make them feel the best version of themselves, but not just members, coaches and everybody. I'll literally have a coffee meeting with each one of my coaches to talk about personal life. Because every coach, every person is driven by something. And not everybody's just financial. So you got to go the extra mile as a gym owner and spend time with your coaches more than you probably do already. So you get to know their personal life and you get to know what's stopping them to become happier. Because it might be simply a lack of money to buy a house that's closer to the job so they can spend more time with their family. Like as long as you understand where they at and what's the best case scenario for them, some coaches, they just care about being the guy that they, that does the programming. Some coaches really just care about being the head coach or like, as long as you understand what drives your coach instead of just focusing on financial and then you build a good team and those people are just going to want it to be around you and want it to kind of, you know, cause you're happier and happier and happier. And that translates to the members. Cause if I have a coach that his dream is to build his own class that focus in hydrox and, and uh, like uh, DECA fit and uh, Spartan race, that's his dream. So, okay, I'm going to go ahead and talk to him and we're going to create that class. How can we help you to get more involved with that community? Basic, I'm real, I'm, I'm uh, making his dream true. Right. Yeah. And when you focus on that, that person is going to be, oh, my God, how can I help the gym even more? Or that gym is also mine because I'm creating my own little thing. Yeah. Right. And then uh, I want my coaches to be with me forever. You know, and I had coaches before that I trained that be like, OK, I have I want to have a business. I want to have a gym. OK, so I'll make sure that while you're here, I'll teach you everything so you can open your gym and be like really transparent because a lot of gym owners, they're very scared. They're very like uh, scared about, oh, my coach is going to bring other members. Oh, it's going to get out of here and bring the members with them or my coaches. You can't be scared of that. You just got to focus in your own business. Well, if that happens, it means you did something right. Right? Of course, on on the paper, it doesn't look great. Yeah. When you lose 20 members in one week because your ex-coach opened the gym next door. But why not to have a partnership? Why not to, you know, like there's yeah, so and, many. And, and yeah. not only that, if that happens, if you focus all the energy in creating a different program and creating value to those members, they won't leave. And th- guess what? They might come back. You know, like there's space for everybody. And and for me, I yeah, think. There's not lack of people in the, on the planet, right? Right? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's just like. I think you got to just focus more in your business. And I think for me as a gym owner, uh, one thing that I can tell to all gym owners and everybody, the secret of, of making that is really uh, making your team happier and understanding what drives your team. And if you're not sure how to do that, get somebody that do that for you and then build that team. And that team is going to translate to the members. You know what I'm saying? Like you don't have to jump your team and focus on the members. Yeah, this is exactly what again Simon yeah. Sinek <laughs> uh-huh. uh, was always talking about. Like he he will come to a CEO of the company in our scenario that's the owner, yeah. right? And he will ask him, "What is your priority?" And the CEO will tell him, "My priority is my clients or my customer." He's like, "That's bullshit!" Like no. Your priority should be people who take care of your customers, not the customer itself. Because at the end, how much time as a gym owner you spend with the with the client? Like what you talk to them once a week in between doors. High and by. High and by, exactly. And it's like how it's going and there is a fresh towel or whatever, you mm-hmm. know? Like, no, like the priority is to make people who are in touch with the customer, with the client, happy. Because yeah. if the coaches are happy, then the clients are happy. And the vibe of the place is good. Hey, this is one thing that in here, well, I mean, mm-hmm. you will learn that very quickly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> from your Three uh, months, I'm from, still a baby. <laughs> yeah. From your perspective. But I know how it is now. I'm a little bit, little bit more outside of this mm-hmm. environment now. And the gyms where I am 
kind of like mm-hmm. not regularly going, but the gyms where I kind of know how it works because I'm now in them there or mm-hmm. I know people there, they do it pretty well because people there care. It's a small, small er community mm-hmm. and you know, like the owners are very involved because they are also have some kind of managerial role mm-hmm. or even coaching and so on. But before the, the gyms where I was like the management were fitness first guys, fitness first is a chain of like classic global gym. That would be like your, I know what is the most LA fitness, uh, LA fitness. Okay. Or you yeah. fit or yeah. Planet so, fitness. Or yeah. Planet like. fitness. Yeah. Exactly. That's your, mm-hmm. that's your classic planet fitness with a, a cro- uh, fit cross a zone mm-hmm. back in the corner, you know, Very small yeah, so, there. so these, these guys, they didn't give a shit about coaches. Coaches for them were numbers and coaches for them were, uh, uh, almost like a turnover material. Like, I don't want to be here. Go away. We'll, we'll get way more than, you know, which kind of makes sense of where they are coming from because in their gyms, it looked and it worked like that because you go for a two weekend seminar, you get your uh, level two, level three PT certification, whatever. And you, you can go and be a personal trainer in this kind of gym where you work on a very low commission, super high hours, right? And not many people can sustain that. So there is a pretty high turnover. Mm-hmm. I came to Dubai 2017 in a year of 2018. So from January, January to December in a gym, uh, in a gym between two locations where we had eight coaches, including the head coach. So four and four per location. Mm-hmm. One of them was head coach. Eventually, uh, within half like uh, halfway there, 2018, that became me. We had ten personal changes on the coaching positions in a year. Wow. Yeah, and that even wasn't like not everybody was replaced. No, it was just such a high turnover. And this it was in average it's six weeks new person. Like how people are getting to, how you build a community with that, you know? So, and it was all about, we were, they were not taking care and they were not prioritizing happiness of the coaches. It was just pressure and do this and this and always uh, pushing, you know? And overall in Dubai, the turnover is higher than other places because people might leave just for a simple fact that they are, moving out, mm-hmm. you know, or there, uh, it's a, it's a coach, a whole family is moving out because husband got a better job across the world. Cool. Whatever that happens. But 10 in a year yes. for such a small place, it's a lot like that's too much. Too it was, much. it was madness. It was just, affects the community. Was, yeah. yeah. It was all the time. There was something happening. People was like, where's this? Cause I was like, yeah, you won't see her anymore. <laughs> You know, and it's like, mm. and then oh, so who is coming? Well, we don't know yet. <laughs> you know? Never know. Just yeah, we will never know. <laughs> it's like well, this guy is coming, but don't get used to him. You know? Don't like it him too almost, much. Yeah, yeah. Don't get too attached. Yeah, yeah? it was almost like that. It was uh-huh. it was madness. And uh, in the meantime, that, that's uh, I I started to develop an internship program just because I've seen that this is this is crazy, and I wanted somebody from within the community who might be interested in coaching. First, I did it just so I have somebody as a freelancer to cover the classes, you know? And then eventually we actually hired one of the guys who went Mm -hmm. through the internship program. It was like, it was working, but it was just, I mean, exactly what you would never do and you would Mm -hmm. never advise anybody anybody to do, you know? And and it's tough because a lot of people, I feel like a lot of gym owners, they don't know. And, and, and it, it's just like they don't look for the resource. And, and it's hard to maintain a team, and it's not for everybody, you know. Like I said, you you as a gym owner or, or as a business owner, you have to be okay for you to be eating less. Like, you have to be okay with that. And it's not easy. And, and, and Staying longer, waking up earlier, yes, exactly. coming first, exactly. leaving exactly. last. And caring about your team, spending time. It's not just caring. Do you know what Mary 
likes it do you know what they need do you know what john is looking for do you know his goals do you know what he wants to be in five years do you know what his dream is like you know you just gotta find out like okay my i'm a coach but my dream is to become a chef okay how about we open we open uh something related to food here and like there's always ways of motivating your your crew but you need to know and it's not like uh Oh, I paid this guy to do that. Okay, but you also, because you're the leader, you're the owner. So you also need to be in touch with all that information. And what if you have people who just want to come in, coach, go home to the kids? Perfect. That's, that's a goal. So don't give them more hours. Don't give them more responsibility. <laughs> okay, so you, you don't mind that kind of attitude? Not at all. Okay. Like it, it depends on the structure that you have for your gym. If you're looking to, like to, to, to build something where your gyms, your coaches, like I used to have a coach that he was like, listen, I want to, he was the best coach. He was amazing, but he only wanted to coach 5 a.m. every day. That's it. That's all he wanted. Okay. That's somebody to open the gym, right? And we like to keep him around and, and other coaches like, oh, but he doesn't do anything, whatever. But that's not his, that's not your job to, no, everybody have their own different roles. So from my perspective and my company, I don't mind having that type of person if that person adds value and classes because like i like the person to do to go above and beyond and do that but again you can always find something for your coach to do if it's something related to what they like if you get a coach that just want to spend more time with their kids or whatever whatever maybe he loves kids so maybe we're going to do an event with kids like you can always find a way do a kids class Yeah, because the coach, like, it, or maybe just a kid event or maybe whatever. Like, if the coach is at the gym and wants to coach, it's because they like to be around people. So, they like to that environment. So, it's just finding a way to motivate them. And if they don't want to be anything else, they just want to have that as a hobby, oh, good. You know, so, you know, you can expect that person, you know, like, you know, you know how much to expect from that person. And, and it's okay in, in this type of business. But again, if you want to build a franchise, if you want to build a team that wants to leave and do, and, and do that, then that's different, you know? But not a lot of gyms want to open more gyms. They just want to have that gym. And if you just want to have that gym, that's fine. But if you want to become Vogue Fitness, then that might be different. You might have, you know, you're going to need yeah. somebody to invest a little bit more on that, you know? Which some companies don't even hire part-time. You know, like they just want people full-time, which is fine too. But you just got to find, as long as you bring value to the company in some way, it's all good. It can work one day. That person brings value. It's enough. What would you say is just, this is just from your experience and your opinion on mm -hmm. first personal training. Mm -hmm. How much coaches should have of a personal training versus the classes? Or where in a gym where you were leading it, was it enough for coach to make enough money just from the classes? I made that. Most of my coaches will make enough money, not all of them. Mm -hmm. But the coaches that will not make enough money coaching, they will make money somewhere else. All right. So if the financial part... So different roles, for example, whatever, social media or something like that. Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. So you, like, if... if Now, to, I'm going to ask you a question about your question, right? Yep. How much personal training should be done with that coach? You mean for the financial part or you mean just for the hours or? Uh, hours. 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 I think a coach is a coach first. But if I think if the coach has his schedule and he's doing more personal training and as long as it's not affecting his coaching, then it's fine. Uh, my coach, the priority is the coach. The personal training is extra. Yeah. It's just okay. like I hire for something else. As long as like you don't mess up what I hire you for, it's yeah. fine. You can do anything. So how many hours a week? I think for me, what works throughout this, um, you know, 10 years around this stuff, I think three hours in a row is what it's enough. You can always do four or five, but I think three is that perfect number. If you can maintain your coaches with three hours in a row, that's good. And maybe another three for personal training. So I think anywhere from six hours. Okay. So for classes only, <coughs> classes, Now, only? classes only, uh, per week, let's say 15, 20. Yeah. 15 to 20. Okay. I think 20 is a good number. 20 is a good yeah. cap. Yeah. yeah it's a okay. good cap. I've coached before the gym that I start coaching. Our classes was five in the morning to 8 PM. 
So 16 hours a day. And I've coached 12 to 15 classes in a row before. Oh, <laughs> you had class every hour? Five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Really? Mm -hmm. 16 hours a day. How many people per class like, <clears throat> on average? Average. Like, okay, so definitely the morning yeah. was busier. Yeah, evening. but like the, the minimum will be like three to five. Really? Yeah. On every one, single one? Two, yeah. What? <clears throat> How crazy. The, what the crazy? <laughs> I know that's crazy. crazy. But so some, you run over. But, but some classes will, wouldn't have any member. Like you have like 2 p.m. with zero people. Like that will happen every once in a while, okay. right? Okay. But like, like meaning I've coached 15 hours in a row for months. Like up to a point that I'll go to the bathroom to eat and I'll be like, like I'll almost burn out. Don't recommend that to anybody. Yeah. Right. So I think I, I, even half of that, I wouldn't recommend. Exactly. But then I was young. I wanted to whatever, like <laughs> just give me everything. Right. Yeah. It gave me an all. It gave me actually a lot of good uh, understanding and like you can put me any type of class and I'll make sure that I'll figure it out. But again, it yeah, was but, too much. But at the end, like definitely your last class of, of the night, for, wasn't the highest quality for six yeah. months of my life about four months four years ago i hated coaching mm. because of that yeah you know? so don't recommend anybody yeah, right for sure. but anyways i think three classes in a row is good uh i'm not a big fan to keep healthy coaches to make them go in the morning come back in the afternoon depends on the business it can always that happen but i think three classes where that last one the person is too excited to give the class and maybe the pt in the afternoon if they coach it once or not so free per day three per day or maybe two morning two evening if that's the model. yeah I, but okay. I, I even prefer three a day you mm -hmm. know like three or maybe i i almost prefer four in a row than two and two just so they don't have to come back yes that coming okay. back for coaches okay it, it, mm -hmm. it's i don't make sense i don't i personally didn't like it for me so mm -hmm. i wouldn't do it with my team you know even though four is a lot in a row but like yeah. I almost prefer to find a way of making the four in a row. Than and with a two. with a break or a gap with 15, a break, 15, with 15, a, 30 minute break with the break ideally, but not all. all gyms not always have it that. works. Yeah, yeah like a, like I book fitness as an example. If five thirty seven and nine, so that's perfect. Yeah, you know. But if the gym is like seven, eight, nine, and ten, yeah. you know, like there's yeah, no yeah, break yeah. in there. Okay. That's, but but yeah, that's three reasonable. to four, three to four. It can be done five, but I think anything over five is just like it's not. Yeah, like in a worst case scenario, I think five is the max a day. I I was there when I was doing, I believe it was two in the morning, three afternoon, for pretty much two months. Weekends excluded, there was one or two classes, and that was when I started, like my early early mm -hmm. first basically first coaching experience. And what was great about it that. Well, people don't like to hear it, but if you are getting coached, you are guinea pig to a certain degree always. Like, yeah. And for me, it was amazing that I can tell you that people who came for the last two sessions, they got very different experience just because I already knew exactly what to do. Like with the flow of the class, the management, the mm -hmm. class management was just super smooth. So you know how, like, if you have to coach five classes and every one is different, you're not going to learn as much as it's exact same class yeah. four, three times, five times mm -hmm. in a row. Yeah. So it was two in the morning, three in the afternoon with half an hour breaks always in between. And it just like the awareness, the group management, the communication skills, everything just skyrocketed. It was amazing just because i was exposed to exact same class over and over again and i could fine-tune the details mm -hmm. and i had no other uh, commitments or nothing else to do anyway so yeah, yeah. <laughs> i enjoyed the shit yeah, out yeah, of it yeah, you know? yeah. <laughs> like so i uh, i wasn't burned out i wasn't you know i was really really enjoying that so no that 30 minute break it, it makes a huge difference yeah. i can tell that you like, can eat in 30 yeah if minutes. you have to do three classes in a row every single day like after doing two in the morning, it's a whole different game, yeah. you know? Uh, but the group management and, and understanding the room, I got to a point that I like to teach that and for my coaches or whoever is around me is it's the same for every class. It's basically like for little amount of people, normal amount of people, big amount of people, 
obviously the programming change it changes the whole thing but how you face and how you prepare for an overall class it's very similar meaning like okay you always got a that's that's how i do up to today i'm expecting a wheelchair guy come in the same class as rich Froney and dave Castro. like they're all dropping into my class in the same day i'm always expecting that yeah. and it's not gonna happen you never know but i'm all, know. but i'm always expecting that like okay i'm gonna have a wheelchair guy that dave Castro is gonna bring with him to be in the same class and rich Froney is gonna be around too so how can i make sure that i'm ready for that yeah so if i'm ready with the same experience for everybody if I'm ready with that mindset and, and uh, you know, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to have somebody that's going to tell me to fuck off. I'm going to tell me somebody that's going to be very nice. Um, like I'm, I'm expecting all different scenarios and I'm kind of ready for all of them. And, and, and after that it becomes fun, you know, it becomes fun. How to, how to, but definitely doing a lot in a row, it gives you more, be more comfortable because, okay, now I know how to do it. I'm going to yeah. do even better. And over time, you basically, because there is only so much possible scenarios, right? So over time, you already have that experience because yes. this was similar than that. And you just build it on top of it. But yeah. because it was very early, it was when I was starting, it was, I would say it was exactly what I needed at that moment. Just it's like me, the 15 so hours a day, it yeah. sounds crazy, but it's what I needed. Like, it's like, it helped me so much. Yeah, I think that's like a uh, different uh, level extreme. Uh, and no yeah. front desk. You know, no really? front desk if there's any walk thing. Like, so I've been to the worst case scenario for a coach, which is great, but I've been too much, almost um, the time that I burn out, but it was enough for me to kind of, okay, now I can see what's, what's good and what's not good. What's the perfect case scenario. Yeah. A coach can coach eight classes a day, six classes a day. But if I want to maintain a healthy coach for 10 years, three is a number. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like I, I'll find a way of making. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you can do 16. You proved it yourself, right? That's what I'm saying. But that's not the optimal yeah. scenario. And I've done 10. I've done five. I've done yeah. one. You're like I've done all different type of scenarios, right? So which is great. But so I know what not to do now, right? Yeah. <laughs> and and to help with the class management, just to finish that topic, sure, sure. I think a good thing that a lot of people don't know and a lot of people don't focus too much time on as a coach, you're dealing with people. Right. So, you know, you need to know how to communicate and you you know, you need to know how to keep their attention. You need to know how to organize the room and keep the energy and keep the vibe. Like I will do courses myself of how to keep attention of 5,000 people when doing a speech. Why? Because there are tricks, like there are other stuff, like keeping your hands above your elbow. It gives you more presence, like moving your body. It makes you look smarter. Not not having the uh, mm, mm, in between, like it doesn't doesn't make you sound like you don't. So there's a lot of little tricks that people don't focus. They just focus in anatomy and coaching and this and movement that it doesn't give them the opportunity to make an awesome class. You need to know how to speak, how to communicate, how to get people's attention, how to make them smile, how to keep them engaged. Like if the class is a mess, how are you keeping them engaged? You know, like there there's so much to be taught around coaching besides the actual cue and movement here and there. Yeah, I mean... The that people don't even know. And they spontaneous. They, they don't spend time on it, you know? Great point on the communication because you can have all the knowledge of the anatomy, physiology, and you can even, uh, you know, have a laser eyes and diagnose the cancer. But if you cannot communicate it well, well, it's lost, right? You can. And, but at process. the same time, if you communicate too well... Then you can get away with not knowing the coaching too. So it's a mix. <laughs> it's a mix of both. Yeah, yeah you know, yeah, like yeah. so. It's just like, and I feel like a lot of people they want to be coached. They know the movements, they know the names, they know the anatomy. But again, they need to understand how to keep the class engaged. What's the sign? What's the music? What type of music you play? What's the room temperature? As a coach, the class gotta be ready ten minutes before. If you're yeah. organizing your class 10 minutes before your class, you're late. You're doing wrong. Yeah. I'm sorry. I've done that before, but you're doing wrong. The class got to look flawless. The box has got to be aligned. Rogue sign on the box got to be from the same. Like you got to create an experience for the person because people appreciate that. Yeah. You know, you got to make sure that you know about who's injured or who's not or who's new and say hello or like low music and a warm up, not completely off because it's, it's awkward, but not too high so you don't scream. Like there's yeah. so much involved. And interestingly, uh, with that sign of the logo of the mm -hmm. uh, box 
facing the same yeah. way, the layout being the same and prepared almost like it's a competition layout, right? right? People might, might not even appreciate it consciously. You know, they might not even realize like, okay, oh, this room is, looks different. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, but they, there's definitely that. And then the comparison, if it's not there, just the feel out of it, right? If it's organized, if it's all smoothly done. And I think this is one big thing that the Ben Bergeron was always saying, like they have a setup for uh, every class. I, I believe they even have it as a part of the programming. Like this is how the layout will be. Or this class, you know, and then everybody feels like they are on a little mini daily competition there. And it's an experience. It's all about the experience. When you create that experience, it's a, it's it makes such a difference, though. And and exactly like the the saying, right? People won't remember what you told them, but they will only remember how they felt around you. Yeah. So it's exactly that. They won't remember maybe all the cues and stuff, but they'll remember that you cheered on them. They will remember that you tried to help them, whatever the outcome yeah. was, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because that's uh, uh -huh. that's not how the things are fixed, yes. just just by snap of the fingers. Mm -hmm. But they will remember there was effort. They will remember that you cared, and they will remember that you supported them. That's what matters because that people will come back. Yeah. Because they, like I said, they don't care about how much weight they lift. They just care about how you make them feel. Yep. And even going deeper than that is how do you control your room? Like you have a class of 50 people. How you control that room? How you keep everybody engaged? That's communication skill that you, you got to understand and learn that. Like for you to make the class be good is a combination of everything. It's literally what type of music you're playing, how high the, the, the volume is, is the room too cold or too hot? Like, do they have space to walk? Do they have uh, a, a spot to put their bag? Like, mm -hmm. the, it, there's so much involved, more than just coaching, you know, that people don't like, do, do, did you make them go get the dumbbell, bring it back and get the dumbbell again? Like, there's so much involved that, yeah. like you said, people don't even know, but they just feel different when it's not there. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. yeah. I want to ask you about programming. Mm -hmm. So what is, what is your approach on that? Programming for general physical preparedness, mm -hmm. how ideal program should look like uh, according to your, mm -hmm. uh, you know, expertise. Is it strength piece and then workout or is it strength piece workout and the core or one workout and everything revolves around that mm -hmm. because there's so many different styles people do and use. Uh, what, uh, what, what you use and what you used to do when you were running the gym? Uh, I think what well, works for me as an athlete too, because when I follow the program, I like, I, in, I need to see results as well. Uh, and I also, is speaking about a business side, okay, what makes sense for the most amount of people, right? Because you can put a competitive program, but it only affects a few people. It's not business, you know, friendly. Yeah, it's but 95 so, to 5, right? You know, like you create exactly. 95% around 5% of your yes, gym members. Yes, exactly. Uh, but basically, I love uh, having a strength. I love having skills. And I love having finishers and I love having just a workout. So basically I love everything. The way that I think the program should be done is with a purpose, right? And for me, I'm a hundred percent an MCI, like mechanics, you know, consistency and intensity. You must master the PVC and you must master basics and body weight before doing anything outside, like any, uh, extra object or like how's your hollow rock before you do your keeping how why you're jumping on the rig if you can even hold a hollow for 10 seconds so i'm very based on basics because then when you master that everything will becomes easier so i always implement skills on the programming because the skills is that specific time that you're working on something but it's not random skills like the programming you have to be okay this month our focus is get people better at this. So everything's gonna be around there. And then we do that for uh, strength as well, or we're doing just a strength cycle as an example. Okay, we're gonna get our members stronger. So we're gonna focus a little bit of strength. And sometimes I do the workout first and then strength after. 
which is some people love that. And I found myself liking it sometimes, depending on how the workout is, to actually do a heavy back squat after because I'm fully warmed up for that. So it really varies. I'm not super like, okay, there's only one way of doing it. Mm -hmm. There's only, you know, I, I like 45 minute EMOMs, you know, uh, but I also like a seven minute MRAP and spending 25 minutes on skills. I don't mind that, you know, but what's the goal? What's the purpose? You got to read the community. If yeah. you have a community that's only people that don't care about CrossFit, don't care about none of this fancy stuff. Okay, so how can we get them better? But also, how can we feed those people that, that care about the competition or they care about this and this and that, you know? And and it's just reading the community, but I don't think there's any right or wrong. I just don't like random stuff. Mm -hmm. I just don't like the, the part of uh, different people doing different programs and like... Like there is no cycle, there is no purpose for it. You know what I'm saying? What what I always uh, struggled with was first of all, and it goes together. First of all, when people were telling mm -hmm. us how to do it, mm -hmm. yeah, and then also tendency, which it's fairly common in many gyms, that oh, what we need to do it this way because. Our people want it that way, you know, like, like actually you're not selling your program, you asking them what you should sell, you know, and that, that was always my big struggle with this mentality because like, no, we do what we do. We do what we believe in and we'll get the right people for that. If mm -hmm. somebody wants something else, some mindless sweat, well, there are places you can get that, but that's not us. We mm -hmm. go for quality mainly. And the second part was that because everybody's a competitor on a CrossFit class, right? right yeah. <laughs> or everybody wants to be. So it was like, but why don't we do heavy back squats before we do workout all the time? You know, like why there is not s uh, warm up and then strength and then skill and then workout and then finisher? It's like, well, because class is 60 minutes, right? Mm hmm. And they saw it because they will look at, uh, you know, uh, Noah Olsen will post what he was doing for a prep of the games for last two months. And he will upload the file online. Like, guys, this is what I did. Just, I don't know if he's selling it or it's a, mm -hmm. a free, uh, trial. free trial or uh, some teaser for a train think tank uh, programming, mm -hmm. whatever it is, but he will release it, right? And then you look at it and it's like, yeah, it has seven pieces there for a day, but he's not doing it in one hour. He's doing it in a whole day, you know, <laughs> like one piece, then another, then break, food, nap, another. Yeah. So, so that misconception that it needs to be like a whole CrossFit in one hour, <laughs> like everything in one hour. I always had a, struggle with that and mm -hmm. to explain people i to, mean we to did explain coaches or members actually both okay uh, of course there were coaches who are understanding yeah. it of course there were people who are understanding it and mm -hmm. there were coaches who were not and there were members yeah. who were not yeah and uh i mean we did it the best way i thought and we thought it's the best for mm -hmm. people but there were always voices against it like i i do not understand if somebody in a CrossFit class where you have general population, okay, they might be fit, mm -hmm. they might be well performing, mm -hmm. but they are far from semifinal qualifiers, let's say. And you do skill of handstand walk as a warm up, then I'm, I'm exaggerating a little yeah, bit, but yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. Then you do clean and jerk for a build up to a heavy clean and jerk, then you do back squats, and the workout has a squat snatches. Like, why? Just focus, as you said, like have a purpose and focus on one thing. Okay, if today's things are deadlifts, then cool. Do heavy deadlifts at the beginning and then do some lighter deadlifts or some similar movement like single leg hinging as an accessory or whatever. Or bridge, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah wh whatever it is, hip thrusts, mm -hmm. yeah, just an accessory with some more conditioning. Let's say, I mean, hip thrust and assault bike, that's an... Yeah. Terrible combination. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, but so I get what you're you saying. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like it doesn't need to be seven different movements in one session just so we can say that we did absolutely everything. And like keep mm -hmm. something for a following day, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 like 
that happens in every single business. And like I'm looking, uh, I've been to so many situations where the members and the coaches come to me about programming and stuff like that. And it's just like, at the end of the day, everybody just want to be hurt. At the end of the day, or oh, hurt, hurt, not hurt. Yeah, no, okay, hurt. not hurt. Yeah, let me say one more time because <laughs> my every everybody day, wants so people day, listen to at them. At the yeah. end of the day, they just want to be heard. Yeah, you know, okay. like they just want to talk to somebody, and the members aren't are different than that. What I see in the business is the explanation don't need to be there because unless you have three to five people that complain every single time about the programming and you know it means nothing then they're the complainers then you approach them and figure out a way but otherwise if you have mary that complained that today we had too much squat snatch she's just complaining today because she had a bad day like she's like you know what i'm saying but if you have the coach or a person that's consistently complaining or not understanding something then the problem is the person if you know you're doing a good job with the programming right and looking on the business side Everybody complains about everything in the world. How can you make sure that you don't, you're not so aggressively aggressive? You, how can you make sure that you're not aggressive with those people to make sure that they see you as a company and they still going to consume your product? Is hiring people that know how to talk. Mm. Is make sure to have people around on the gym because your gym it's a business. Gym owners, your gym is a business. It's not a hobby. If you keep treating it as a hobby, you're going to have silly little problems. If you treat it as a business, then you understand a lot more and then you avoid all this. So hire somebody. Every single gym, you have a teenager or you have someone that's very friendly, right? That person can work with you in a gym and talk to those people. Okay, uh, John, you complain about the, the programming, whatever. Okay, but... Okay, so, but why do you want back squat? Like, start putting the questions to them. Okay, why don't we do this? And they're like, okay, why should we do that? Give me a good reason. I'm here listening. Sell it to me and I'll do it tomorrow. <laughs> and then they will not know what to say, right? Because they, they don't know. They just want to complain. They just want to be heard, right? And if you, if you make them, okay, I'll work on that. Okay, I'll do my best. So, oh, you want a back squat? Why do you want back squat? Oh, because you want to get better your legs. Oh, because if oh, how about that? I'll give you a special program for you so you can do before the class. It's going to take 10 minutes a day. That's it. You're selling programming right there. Yeah. It's just looking from a different point of view, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, and, and not being, uh, not taking personal because nothing is personal. Nothing in life is personal, if you ask me. Yeah. I have, I have a, I believe that this is a very big problem that people have as a coaches as well, like immediately as the client. And it might be on a personal training, it might be on the class, it might be within the gym. Uh, if uh, somebody will ask them a question, why is it this way? And they, they already see it as a personal attack. They already think that it's questioning them, it's questioning their methods, and it's questioning the efficiency you of everything. You don't know enough, the, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it just might be a genuine interest, or as you're saying, they're having a bad day and they want to take it out on somebody. And listen, yeah. it might make sense. They might be right about something. I had members that came to me and say, listen, the programming, we haven't touched wall balls in a while. And I was like, oh shit, right? Let me yeah, figure yeah. out why, you know? And uh, it's fine. Just take it as, as not an offense. But if your coach is taking everything personal, then the problem is the coach, not the member, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. and, and I believe that if it's too much of a complaining, then there's something there. But if you want to be even more professional, have that smile person, that happy face that everybody loves it, that don't take anything personal and take care of all the complaints. Guys, we want to make sure that every single person in the gym have the best experience in the world. So we are investing time and money in a different type of role now, which is going to be the heart of the gym, the heart manager of the gym that makes sure that everybody's happy all the time. Any complaints, you go to Mary. She's prepared for that. This is this is epic solution because if that person is there, their job is to take all the complaints and you know like whatever Filter you, them to the owner. Yeah. Yeah, like whatever you uh whatever you call that role, like a happiness manager or yeah. <laughs> you know you can make yeah, up a name. Yeah. Whatever you complain to that whatever people complain to that person about is never going to get personal for them 
because they are not in charge of programming. They are not coaching. They are not, you know, they're like not the ones doing. Yeah, it's it's always not going to be personal. Yeah, which is like a brilliant, uh, brilliant way. Or just get somebody with no emotions. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or or, yeah. or another tip: get a very good looking lady or a very strong dude. <laughs> and the complaints are gonna get less and less and less you know what i'm saying it's just how people are right so like yeah. if you really want to invest in that and and people are gonna be like oh my god uh look at luan he's really investing in the gym he's making sure that we're happy by having somebody just to make sure that we're happy that's amazing now yeah. you turn the situation would you take that as a full-time role in a gym or wh who would you hire for this uh that person it can be the front desk uh necess ideally both like to be the same person right mm -hmm. every every complaint go to the front desk and it can be the same person but listen depending on how many people i have i'll consider that person to be like a, a kind of community manager mm -hmm. and take care of not only that but then i'll find more roles like i'll literally be like yeah, okay, obviously that would be yeah, a little I bit limited a, role yeah there. but yeah. then i'll be like okay i need everybody's birthday i need uh one thing one good thing about every person that, of the gym that person will have to i'll make that person work yeah, events Yeah, 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 events or mm -hmm. anything. Like, mm -hmm. okay, every single member of the gym, I need to know their birthday. I need to know uh, one thing that they want. Like, I'll make sure that person really gets to the community, you know? And then, and and that's it. Your problem is solved. But like like you said, that person is not even doing anything. So that person's like, okay, you know? And that if that person is smart, that person can be like, you know what? I also don't like the programming today. I'm going to talk to the owner. Yeah, People that know how to talk, they will talk, you know? This is one other thing. Do you or have you? I mean, mm -hmm. now you're not yeah. specifically in that role, but mm -hmm. do you advise the head coaches or owners to require for coaches to do the programming of the gym? No. No? No. Nope. So you don't mind if coaches are not doing the programming not at all. with the members? Coaches are not programmers. It's the different no, no, no. profession. I mean, I mean, to do the class. What do you mean? Uh, not to do the programming. I mean, to do the class with members, like oh, to have yes. the same experience. So that, sorry. Okay. Yeah, that's that's absolutely yes. yes. I thought you being like being in the programming, like writing. No, 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 no. Yeah. No. I mean, like, like to yeah. to actually follow yeah. the program. Yeah. Same so way. Yeah. to to answer the question that you didn't ask, like <laughs> they, I, yeah, you're gonna my, get my there. Bad. No, no, no. no, no go yeah, for it. yeah. Like meaning, like the coaches uh, don't have to do the programming. A programmer is one thing. A coach is another thing. Yeah. Doesn't mean that they both are okay. So yeah, that's yeah. aside. And absolutely like almost mandatory that they do two to three classes a week Perfect, with yeah. the class, not even an open gym. Yes, absolutely. With not just have the experience of the workout. It's to have the experience the within the community. And as a head coach, you should do one every day because then you see the reality. Yeah. You know? That's the way you connect with people is by doing class with them. And if It's you, partnering with Mary that don't even know how to squat, like making that person feel yeah. good, you know? Absolutely, a hundred percent. And you will also really think twice about putting people through some stupid shit if you do the program as well, right? <laughs> oh shit! What a long yeah. warm up. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. You realize that for yeah. sure. No, uh, absolutely. It's it's like I said. It it is uh, mandatory, and uh, it can be even in a job role, like in a, in a like in a when you sign, when you become a, a employee at the company, mm -hmm. you might even be there. You must do the class. Okay, so it's part, part of, of the salary. contract. Yeah, part of the contract nice okay so we have some uh friends animal activity here mm -hmm. I don't believe you. <laughs> let me show you who's the boss <laughs> yeah, she, she's trying to play with him the same way she's playing with dogs in the park uh, so but he's not biting back that, so she, she wants he's more and more yeah. and more yeah okay anyway <laughs> uh, -huh. <laughs> uh so okay so i want to ask you about your consulting stuff what you do now perfect like, what is what is that about now yeah so basically uh not sure if i have mentioned here yet but i did mention to you uh i am at, with vogue fitness now so mm -hmm. I'm, i'm part of the team uh coaching only that's my only role there and uh, i do have my mentoring consulting company on the side that i built back in america where i realized that helping gym owners and coaches i'll reach more people so i do have my online uh company which is online and in person which is my mentoring company mm -hmm. which i assist uh gym owners and coaches how to reach excellence you know in different areas so we basically kind of got a short master class correct of what you do correct yeah correct. you look at their business 
look at their community maybe yeah look at everything you possibly can look do at do a scan on it yeah. <laughs> yeah analyze it and see the gaps fill the gaps correct or tell them how to fill the gaps correct yeah and and people that just as a mentor and as a consultant like it's like therapy like when you do therapy it doesn't mean that you need help it just means that you can get better yeah So yeah, yeah. with the mentor, meaning like when gyms look at it, oh, I don't need a mentor. What do you mean? Am, am I doing anything wrong? No, no, no. But you can get better. Yeah. Just different ways of looking, you know? Yeah, yeah. it's not exactly. It doesn't necessarily mean that we always say coaches need coaches, right? Like it's, yeah. it doesn't necessarily mean just because you do it for whatever X years. Maybe that is the problem that you do it for so long in the same way that you just stuck in some way and you just need a fresh perspective or just that mirror yeah that to okay see. yeah see you see this is going on and i can imagine people just go whoa yes. like oh it's, shit it's basically <laughs> like you it's like when you do uh you take medicine not medicine i'm not going to use medicine as as the example but like Era, let's say a couple, right? A couple goes to a therapy couple, right? So they go to a therapist that they, they usually, and the person like, why do you guys go to a therapy? You know, your measure looks good. Everything looks good. So, and they're like, we go to uh, the therapy. So our marriage is good. Meaning okay. like, you don't wait for your marriage to get bad. It's preventive. Then, correct. Yeah. You know, it's like you go to the doctor. So then you don't take medicine yeah. instead of taking medicine. So you don't go, like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So as a mentor, it's the same thing. Like, having somebody a mentor and a consultant and, and somebody to talk to you about specific situations it just prevents you for uh getting to trouble you might your gym might be phenomenal but how about you have somebody with accountability so you don't get in trouble yeah you know so somebody who can see it from outside from a different perspective and can maybe see the let's say unhealthy habits that eventually might become a problem, even yep. it's not showing yet. Yeah. Uh, so, and you do this for coaches, mm -hmm. for coaching, coaching? itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You also do it for gym, gym owners, gym owners mm -hmm. for the business. Correct. And I'm cool. basically, I'm actually opening, uh, You know, I'm, I have a few situations that's forcing me to get to two different products that are related to that, which is like, if you want to become a coach, I'll help you become a coach. You mm -hmm. don't even have to be a coach. Okay. Like I'll, I'll, I'll guide you through that. And if you want to open a gym, I have a, I have that help as well. All right. Like you don't necessarily have a, like if you don't have a gym, but you want to have a gym, I'll teach you how to get there in a healthy way. And then after that, we can keep our mentoring so your gym keeps going in the right direction, right? Because okay. I do have a lot of coaches that come to me like, oh, I wish I had a gym. I was like, okay, why don't you have? And then I start developing more of that. And I have uh, members that will be like, okay, uh, I wish I was a coach. Okay, why are you not a coach? So, you know, yeah, like yeah. I'll kind of open those two doors. Yeah, so it'd be kind of like kicking yeah. them yeah. <laughs> the, and, and, the direction and, and, they already want to go. It's right? just they, yeah, they have the, yeah, so yeah. They, that's a big part of it. They, they need the how to yeah. get there. Yeah. yeah, and understand why they yeah, want that, yeah. you know. Cool. And uh, overall, mm -hmm. how is it going? It's doing great. Uh, I have a few clients back in Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually, I am building what I like to call a winning table is where I get together with a few people here in UAE already, mm -hmm. where I talk and discuss with them a couple of things about opening gyms and understanding where they're at so I can develop that community. So as of right now, uh, It's growing here. I'm, I'm making my working here in UAE. I want to make sure that I help as many gyms as possible. My main goal is to uh, give as many gyms as possible in UAE what I've learned in the past 10 years in America about CrossFit and about, you know, management and about like execution and about like entrepreneur and all that. And for the coaches as well, how can you stand out, right? Look at a couple of things, like I talked to you about a, a skill of communicating that people are not teaching that out there. Yeah. You know, they're not focusing on it. And I think we're missing a lot of that. So in Florida, is doing good. Again, it's it's my side kind of job, a company, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's where my main energy goes to. So eventually, yeah, yeah. financially, it's going to be my main resource. But energy-wise, it is already my main yeah, source. Yeah, yeah. You That's know? your baby. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. How hard or easy 
was it to sell gym that you built, you developed from 100 to 400 and you put your heart and soul into it? How was it to just, you know, step aside and leave the country? Actually? Yes, uh, that was a big move. Uh, selling the gym was, uh, again, I sold it to my partner, so it's in great hands. Uh, and it's just like, it was very that it was very emotional for some in some point but very exciting uh in, an, in another way that now i'm like literally coming to uae right to to grow my resume and to grow my knowledge and meet people uh and because my purpose still help other people and gym owners and all that it's like I still help in some sort of way, even if it's through Instagram, my community mm -hmm. with information and when it, all that. And I actually uh, mentor a few coaches back from my gym. So <laughs> it's just like, which is oh, great. So, so you have very close eyes on it. Yes, I'm, yeah. always, I'm always watching and, and making sure. So it's just like, okay, guys, let me find a way to promote fitness and better quality of life to more people. But everywhere that I go, they still have, contact with me mm -hmm. you know a certain way and and because my vision is so big and i want to get to a point that i'm literally want to build <laughs> you know if like if you go a little bit crazy now in my mind it's like i literally want to build uh cities and countries uh like how to promote fitness in their own gyms and how can we make how can we inspire people or how can we make people overcome their insecurities with fitness and other things too so i think very big and i think being stuck in one gym was like i'm so happy to be here and I'm very you know what i'm saying but at the same time I, i felt like i was a bird and i couldn't fly okay so now that i'm flying i'm like okay like i can still see that so it's not that i got okay never gonna see you again so i'm, I'm still very excited it, but it was very challenging but actually coming from us to uae now i feel like i can leave anywhere like everything's just so easy you know <laughs> i came to a country that's a different community you do the same different religion uh 18 hour flight from my house so it's just like oh, yeah. the worst not the worst but the most different way possible mm -hmm. you know and it, it's easy man like people just fantasize too much about changing and moving and doing this and this and that and it's just like not a big deal This is how I feel. Like it, it is the, a, the toughest is to make the decision. Once you make the decision and make the move, like I can. I, I was asked a couple of days before I was flying, mm -hmm. uh, first time flying here, and I was asked by one guy, it's like, "Are you not scared? Like, like it's such a big like you yeah. don't know anybody there." And it was the first time I started to think about it. You know? <laughs> I wasn't even, I already knew that I, uh, I'm flying out for a couple of weeks, you know, or uh, I just might not have the specific date, but I knew I was going and then it was getting closer. I was excited a lot. And then it was like, so are you, are you scared? Are you not scared? Like, well, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's like, I wasn't really thinking about it. It's like, what, what am I scared of? Like, I, I went to a very civilized country to a very civilized community of people, maybe in some ways more civilized than where I'm coming from. Mm. <laughs> Not to offend anybody. Yeah, no, I know? get it. Yeah. The reality. And, yeah, and then it's just like, no, like, look, I I'm not, as you are not, bonded here with anything. Like, If you want to leave, you can leave. Like, we are not the prisoners here, right? Like, if something goes different way than we expect we, we just go somewhere else we figure it out like it's not much different than starting new school and this and that and uh, i always had this also like you know uh, homesickness like i'm not homesick because until and unless i know that my family my brother my parents my family are doing well i'm good and i don't have to necessarily see them every day and come on with all the technology it's so easy anyway like <laughs> it's it's not a big deal like this is not like i need to take a, a half a year uh barefoot trip just to get home right, right? like <laughs> if i need to i can be there tomorrow like yeah. it's that easy you know yeah. so it is definitely not a big deal man and people and i think people make everything a big deal like 
everything they make a big deal like they think like oh my god uh if i do this what's gonna happen like you don't even know what's gonna happen tomorrow yeah so yeah, yeah. why are you so worried about okay if i go to uae what a, like do i even open a company there but what if i miss my, like it's just too much it, of it, thought this is a great point that on the uh geographical scale it's like oh the, and this might be this and this and this and that but what about time scale You have no idea what will come tomorrow. You have no idea what will come in a week and you can still be in the same city and you'll be fucked up, you know? Especially Florida, come on, like you have hurricanes right? there all the time, right? Exactly, <laughs> and, and it's just like, and you don't even know about your personal like preferences. Like you don't even know what you're going to like tomorrow. Yeah. You don't even know anything. Yeah. So like, why are you so worried about it? It's that expression, you don't even know what you don't know. Exactly. And you need to experience something new to... Yeah, and, and guess what? Out. If I came as an example for myself, if I came to EA and didn't like it, I'm back to Florida and that's it. Yeah. Like the, there's no, pff, there's nothing wrong with that. Or if you want to open a company, open a company. If you want to get married, get married. Like people make everything such a big deal. Uh, you know, I, I'm i not sure how, the, is, they call it beta state, I think. Beta state? Beta state. And it was, uh, I've seen it somewhere on some Insta Reels or something. It was a guy explaining that Uh, there is a certain breaking point beyond we behave differently. The example was, if you're going to walk a kilometer, you are okay with it, you walk one kilometer or one mile. But if it's two, you're already taking your car. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So the one kilometer, in a, as a paradox, can yeah. take you longer time than two kilometers. Mm -hmm. And... That breaking point we have with all the decisions we we make, in a sense, until situation is not too bad, we are staying in it. And when the situation becomes too bad, that's when we decide, like, no, this is enough, I leave that job, I leave that partner, I do this, I do this, I do this. But so many people are in that beta state which is that space where, well, it's not great, but it's not too bad either. Mm -hmm. And that's where they find a comfort in that mild, mm, unpleasant situation. And they don't want to leave that because they suspect that everything else might be worse. Yeah. Yeah, but what if it will be better? What if it's a lot better? Yeah. Yeah, but, but that's the thing. Like, If you are in a not that great relationship, you will stay. If it's fucking terrible, you will leave. So sometimes making the situation way worse is actually helping people to make the decision, right? Make make a move. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's that's that uh, that's kind a, of that's a very good point. That's that the complacency that uh, people are many time in, and that's why they don't want to move. They don't want to try because, like, yeah, but I mean, it's not great what I do now, but it's okay. You know, like it's yeah. that I'm fine. You know, well, you gotta you be, don't. you gotta be, you got exactly. You gotta be like either at my point of view, like speaking about happiness, either you gotta be so excited to do what you do or you're doing wrong. There's no in between. Mm -hmm. And there is a thing for everybody. You just gotta spend that energy looking for that and, and finding a way of doing it. And it's just like, oh, but I don't have time, but you don't understand. No, no, no. But you're never going to find it without trying. Like that that's the main thing. Like yeah. you need to try oh, new but things too, to find it. But I'm too old, I'm too that that's bullshit. Like if you're 40 right now and you listen to this, you're young. Like you can do 40s. You know, if you like unless you're like 75, 80 and you have no idea what you want, then you might freak out for <laughs> a little bit. Be yeah. Too late. <laughs> But like if you're 30, 20, like if you're 25, like you can f do everything wrong for the next But, 10 years and you're still okay. Yeah. But even even 80, I mean, that might be an exception, obviously, yeah. but it's a great example. Like a lady, she was like, I started to run when I was 80 and she's 100 years old and she's running marathons, you know? Started How at crazy 80. Is that? You know, it's like, so it's never too late if you're willing to yeah. put some work in and some kind of sacrifices. Mm -hmm. Usually, the sacrifice in a meaning of expanding energy. So. Yeah. And, and, and like you said, you're not going to know if you don't, if you don't try. Yeah. You just got to try it. 
And if you and how cool is that if you try a hundred things and they all go wrong? Now you know what not to do for a hundred things. And you have shit ton of experience. Yeah, and like <laughs> you know where not to go. How yeah. cool is that? Now, yeah. Imagine like you think you want this, but you think you want that. No, it's just gotta... but but even even like what would be a definition like that thing didn't work out? It's like exactly. So what what did you lose? Like you lost money. Like okay. Uh, you lost the time there, like, okay, you still got the experience. Yeah, exactly. You still got that experience from it. And so. even if you hated doing that, you know where not to go. So that's experience. Yeah, <laughs> you exactly. Know? That's, so that's the, like, okay, at least I know what to avoid. Right? Yeah. So it's just like... Stepping stone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's not, it's nothing's a big deal, man. People just make everything a big deal. So coming here for me, I was like, okay, goes well. Like, I, and, and I have it in my heart that I have a purpose here and I have... Uh, what I dream and I'm Christian. So everything that's in my heart, I feel like it's God talking to me. So what I have in my heart is so big that it didn't make any sense for me to stay one place, you know, cool. for me. Makes so sense, I yeah. think this place is going to be a trampoline to, to a lot of things in my life. Well, let's see. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, uh, you have something to add or to say? To uh, the end? No, it's just like, If you're around the fitness industry, if you around this era, area, and uh, you have a new guy in town, you have a new guy in the UAE. Count on me. I came with a tons of experience. I came with a lot of uh, fire, and I'm hungry to help. And I want to provide and give and serve as much as possible to the country and to the community. And you can literally help. With anything to anybody. Yes. Within that space. True. One way or the other. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Right. Cool. Uh, well, I, I'm pretty sure this wasn't the last podcast we do together. So nope. yeah. See you next time. Thank yes. you so much. See you could. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.